Welcome back to Innovation Fridays. Are you ready to take your business to the next level? The Caribbean's top entrepreneurs and business leaders are ready to share the insights, tips, and tools you need to pivot to success by transforming your business for the digital age. Today's keynote speaker is Mark Farrell. Once the youngest VP in the history of Starbucks, Mr. Farrell leveraged his experience, his Ivy League education, and his love for his home of TNT to found the award-winning 10 to 1 Rum. He's here today to share his steps to success with you, his fellow Caribbean entrepreneurs. Then, Flow Business Brand Ambassador and Online Business Coach Karen Rose returns to give you a masterclass in crafting your brand presence and making a sale in his hands-on digital workshop. Monique Powell, the CEO of QuickCut, a Jamaica-based online food delivery service, will be sharing her top tips for business success in the digital age. Finally, we'll shine the customer spotlight on Nathaniel Adams and Monique Hanna. Don't forget, just one week left to score a chance to win big in the Innovation Pitch Challenge. And now, introducing our host. If you attended last year's innovation events, you know you're in great hands and in for a lively and entertaining show. He's our Director of People for BTC, but today, he's Master of Ceremonies for our innovation event, live streamed from the Bahamas. Please give it up for Kay Darren Turnquist. What an introduction. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm delighted to welcome you to the second event of our Innovation Small Business Friday series. This event series is brought to you by Flow Business and BTC Business in collaboration with our partners at Tech Beach Retreat. A big thank you to Tech Beach Retreat and their global tech community supporting Flow Business and BTC Business in bringing our amazing speakers with you today. We have an action-packed agenda, so let's take a look at what our agenda calls for today. Well, definitely I see that we have, of course, our keynote speaker is going to be speaking to us, but before that, we're gonna hear from two dynamic people here in the BTC business, our director of B2B business here at BTC, our senior manager of SMB. Of course, our keynote speaker, Mark Farrell, is going to be joining us. Kieran Rose is going to be bringing some exciting, exciting nuggets for you in terms of how to really get your business going. I'm gonna take some special notes on that. And then after that, we are going to have an opportunity to hear from a winner of our pitch competition and also get to hear who are the six finalists this year from that pitch competition that we had going on. Once that is completed, you are going to get to hear from Monique, who is going to also give us some exciting information as well. And then we're gonna tailor down and get ready for what is going to happen in the following show next week and give you some information on how you're able to join us there. Ladies and gentlemen, today you do not want to miss a single second of this event. But before we hear from our first speaker, help me welcome Mr. Andre Knowles, our senior, our director of B2C Business. Thanks very much, Darren. Look, I'm delighted to welcome all of our small business owners, both here in studio and joining us virtually from across the Caribbean. At BDC Business and Flow Business, we like to think of ourselves as the partner to help you take your business to the next level. That starts with providing you with fiber fast connectivity and digital smart solutions so you can grow your business online. This is backed by 24 seven support when you need it. Through our innovation events, we're building a community, a community of peers, entrepreneurs who've made it, and those who have hit hurdles in their entrepreneurial journey, but have the tenacity to keep going. It's why we exist. And I'm so proud to kick off this second innovation event this year, live streamed here from the Bahamas. Welcome and enjoy the program. Thank you so much, Andre. Tanil Simmons, our senior manager for small business has joined us on set for a quick recap on the evolution of the Innovation Conference. Tanil and Andre, we started this journey in 2019, and here we are in 2022 at the Innovation Conference, and it's now international. We've introduced a pitch competition, and we've started two conferences per year. Give us your thoughts on how you feel about this evolution, because when I think about it, Tanil, I remember the days of being back in Bahamar with <laughs> hundreds of people, and us being excited about the fact that we were we were videotaping it and sending it to the family islands. It is now all across the region, and I'd like to say all across the world. 
Just tell me how you feel about this. Absolutely, it's all across the world because as we start to talk about getting our customers to transform into a digital space, we obviously had to take the mantle and do the same thing. So in 2019, when we launched the first innovation conference at Bahama, it was a spectacular event. We got to be up close and personal with our small business owners. And then we also got to be able to give them the nuggets that they needed to take their business to that next level. We all know what happened in 2020. Everything shut down, but we didn't want that to stop us. We wanted to still be able to bring our customers the innovation, the networking, the access to the, to the information to take their business to the next level. And so, of course, with everything going virtual, we did the same thing as well. And, you know, some persons thought that it would have been a watered down version because we weren't able to connect. But, you know, it, it actually turned out to be something more. We not only connected locally, but like you said, we connected regionally with all our Caribbean small business partners. And then we also connected internationally as well. Um, I think adding the innovation pitch competition added that extra element yeah. because we then was able to then see the engagement yeah. level coming in from those small businesses because they were passionate about taking their business to the next level. They were passionate about being seen and we gave them a platform to do that. But you know, Andre Tanil, what I found most interesting was the cross-fertilization between our entrepreneurs in different parts of the region who were sharing their experiences via yes. the chat and connecting about collaboration and about trade. I mean, yes. this is what it's all about. And so as a leader that really started this process, both of you working together, Andre, tell me your thoughts as head of B2B, looking at what innovation is today, looking at this studio audience, so because I want you all to make some noise too. We do have people in studio. Oh, y'all can make some noise. <laughs> Looking at this amazing studio audience, tell me what that feels like as a business leader at BBC. Well, thanks, Darren. You know, when we started off with the conference, as Tanil stated, you know, it was uh, our first time in 2019, yeah. and it was at the hotel, and it was, you know, it was an extreme success. COVID came and uh, threw a big challenge to us. Uh, but just like we expect entrepreneurs to do, you meet your challenge. And I think that we met that, and yeah. we took advantage of it, certainly with going virtual. We only reached a certain uh, smaller audience because it was live, but because we've gone virtual, and not only here within the Bahamas, but within the region, because the issues that uh, the entrepreneurs have here in New Providence or in the Bahamas, it's the same issues that, are, that other companies and other entrepreneurs have yes. regionally as well. So they learned from each other and they fed off of each other. And it's this proliferation of ideas that, 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 that comes from this conference that gives the folks, you know, a better digital understanding, understanding. how to move forward. Right. And I think that, you know, you can't beat that. That is, that is information that is um, absolutely necessary for those entrepreneurs that want to make that next step with their business. And I love it because it's just, you know, a Friday, you know, per week. You get a, a couple hours out of a Friday where you can really get an experience, get an understanding, and the quality speakers. Yeah. I mean, this guy, Mark Farrell, who we're about to hear from today, I don't want to preempt it, but I was listening to uh, the CBS show on him, and I'm thinking, this is absolutely dynamic. amazing absolutely. and dynamic. Oh. And I remember one lady that was presenting, and the name just dropped from me just now, but she said she knocked on the door of the CEO for seven years to get her syrup her yes. maple syrup mm -hmm. into a building. And I'll tell you, I've been knocking on some doors too. <laughs> I'm just really waiting for those doors to open. And so I, 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 I want to say to both of you, congratulations on your success. Congratulations on really bringing this uh, to, 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 I mean, to, to reality and then watching the reality move to the world. This is fantastic. This is really what the Bahamas is all about, but also what the Caribbean is all about. I'll tell you, we have people joining us from all across the Caribbean. Yeah. Get into the chat. Make certain that every exchange that you have today is an exchange where you are looking to further your business, to further your brand, to further your platform. And just, you know, I always say to people, I like to be like Nike. Just do it and do it big. So, you know, to both of you, I share your sentiments, very good points about what we are doing, what we're going to continue to do. And I just want to say thank you for your thoughts. Thank you for your work. And thank you for your investment in entre entrepreneurs. Now on with the show. I'm delighted to welcome Mark Farrell to the Innovation Small Business Fridays. Mark is the founder of 10 to 1 Rum, which recently welcomed music sensation Ciara as a co-owner. Co Let's learn more about Mark. 
Mark Farrell is reimagining what rum can be and sharing Caribbean culture with the world through his 10 to 1 distillery. Prior to founding the company, Farrell was the youngest VP in Starbucks history at age 33. Born and raised in Trinidad and Tobago, he attended MIT at age 16, followed by the University of Cambridge and Harvard Business School. Today, he'll show you how you can pivot to success and grow your business in the digital age. Let's give a warm welcome to Mark Farrell. Hi, Mark. Welcome to the Bahamas virtually. It's an honor to host you virtually here today. A special thank you to our partners at Tech Beach for connecting Mark with our innovation audience today. Mark, welcome, welcome, welcome. We're sending you some of uh, our Bahamian love and Bahamian sun and, of course, all the Caribbean flavor that we can possibly send you over there. How are you today? Yeah, doing pretty well, Darren. Thanks so much for having me. Really, uh, really uh, great pleasure to join you guys this morning. Sorry I couldn't be down there in person, but hopefully for the next one. Well, it's delayed, but not denied. We'll make certain that that happens somewhere in 2022 or somewhere in 2023. Mark, you know, I had the opportunity to do some, you know, fantastic research on you. And what I found so interesting was not only your academic past, not only, you know, what you've done in terms of your career, but the way you've taken this product and the cultural aspects that, and historical aspects that you've brought out of it. I mean, I was listening to it and thought about bootleg legging. It took me back into my, my history class from like grade seven. Um, and, and that's just a lot of thought and the involvement of the creative culture and the creative economy. But I wanna know, you know, what was your passion and dream career while you were at school? I was supposed to be a medical doctor. Everly, that didn't happen. But tell me about you and, and what that passion was and that drive was. Yeah, I mean, you know, if I kind of think back through the, <laughs> through the school, the school days, you know, anything from a professional athlete to nuclear physicist to, uh, you know, sort of Fortune 500 CEO. But, but the, the, the entrepreneurial passion was always there. You know, I kind of remember sitting in class in Form 4, Form 5 and talking about, you know, wanting to, 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 to build this corporation one day that could have an impact um, certainly um, on the Caribbean stage and on the global stage as well. I think though there is um, a, a, a long journey that you might take a time is trying to figure out sort of exactly where that entrepreneurial passion um, resides and where you have an opportunity to kind of carve out that niche um, in the broader business mm -hmm. landscape. So, um, you know, uh, between then and now, you know, that's 25 years ago at this point, um, you know, having done everything from management consulting and private equity to starting a business in sports media to obviously spending some time at Starbucks before finding my way home uh, to 10 to 1 Rum. Well, you know, Mark, you said that so, so with such humility, spending some time at Starbucks. Let me just inform the studio sure. audience and those that's joining us virtually. You know, you were vice president of e-commerce at Starbucks in your early 30s. You know, their youngest VP ever. I'd like to say that I contributed significantly to your salary in the amount of mo white chocolate mochas I purchased. But, you know, how did you climb the corporate ladder so fast at such a young age? Um, it's, a, it's a great question. Sometimes I wonder that myself. I, um, you, you know, I think that um, a combination of factors were at play there, right? I mean, I, I, you know, some of it honestly is just the, the, the good fortune of having someone, um, in this case, Howard Schultz, who is found, founder and CEO of Starbucks, who's willing to take a chance on you and believes in you, right? I think, I think as a young up and coming uh, entrepreneur or young up and coming, um, you know, sort of corporate executive, um, I think it does take a, a little bit of, uh, you know, belief on the part of others who kind of see something in you that sometimes you don't see in yourself. So, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I, I always kind of want to start by, by, by paying sort of due respect and giving due credit there, because I think that like it, it's very hard to kind of sit down and say that, you know, that is entirely a testament to, to, to the things that you have done on an individual level. Um, I think, you know, for me, if I kind of go through my career from this from the very beginning to now, Finding those mentors um, who are able to shine a little bit of a light for you in terms of um, what's been what's been done before, uh, ways in which you can approach it. I'm going to, again, kind of give you that encouragement to stretch yourself beyond what you think might be possible. I think it's honestly a big, big part of that story. Um, you know, I think the other piece, I think the other lesson from that Starbucks experience is, and I, I say this a lot, 
um, whenever the story of someone's career trajectory gets told, um, you know, even sort of in the, in the opening bio and all of that stuff, it ends up getting told in a very sort of linear fashion. And it gets told in a way that makes it all, all sound like it made sense. So I did this, and then I did this other thing, and I did this other thing, and they were all great, and they were all successful, and, and that's actually not they the all case. lined <laughs> up. They all. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's it's it's. I tell people, you know, um, um, your career journey, just like innovation, just like success, they're all nonlinear. And mm -hmm. and um, I think a big part of even the Starbucks experience was this kind of willingness to say yes to things, um, say yes to one additional conversation, one, uh, yes to one additional introduction, one additional meeting, and you never know where those things might lead. Um, and so I think kind of, again, approaching it with a relatively open mind, um, some enthusiasm, of course, having the confidence to share your own personal story and the things that you could uniquely bring to the table. I remember when I, when I got to Starbucks, one piece of counsel I got from Howard and from um, our CMO at the time, Sharon Roth's Roth team, was to, um, I mean, really kind of be yourself, right? You know, you're, you're here for a particular reason to bring a very specific point of view, um, a specific lens exactly. that you can offer. So you're not trying to sort of like shape shift and fit in with the sort of the perspective and the experience others have. I think kind of carving out that niche for yourself where you are bringing something unique uh, to the table is a, is, a, is a major, major ingredient in, I think, securing a role like that. You know, Mark, when I, when I listen to you, and especially being in my field as a, as a human resource person, right? Sometimes, you know, people believe that their, their career journey or the success journey, as you said, should be a straight line. And they don't understand that it's, it's a journey, which means you got turns and, you know, you have a red light sometimes, a, a, a amber light and a green light. And not every day that, that, that green light is going to be green. And, and so when I listen to you, you say two things here. One, you know, it's not always linear. And two, mentors, you know, no, no man or woman is an island, you know, and the question I think persons need to ask as they listen to you is who is that support system that you have outside of your family? Who is that person that sees it before you, uh, you see it and, and continue to push you? But you went from, you know, a high powered executive job and, 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 and it wasn't linear. I think it was at, at this particular point, you went from a steady paycheck to risking it all, like completely flat, like, you know, deuces, I'm gone. Like I'm doing something big. Like how, like, how did you make that pivot? Like what, what was the mental process that you went through? What was the thing that got you to say, I'm out, I'm going to, I'm going to take a chance on myself. What, what was that experience like? What was that thought process like? Yeah, I mean, I always tell people that in a lot of ways, um, um, you, you, when you sort of land in this entrepreneurial sphere, um, it starts off as a little seed that's planted, um, fairly innocuous mm -hmm. at times. Um, you know, it might be something fairly whimsical, it might come up in conversation with your friends, it might be a problem you've spotted sort of in the wider world. And it's one of those things that kind of takes root in your mind, right? And continues to grow, continues to matriculate, I think, until it becomes impossible to ignore. <clears throat> Some people kind of ask me, how did I get to the point where I decided to leave Starbucks and, and start time to one? I, it, it got to the point where it was impossible to ignore, right? Um, and, and, you know, you're having these conversations with your friends, with colleagues, you're pressure testing it. You know, in, in my case, you're sitting at a bar, talking to bartenders, trying to understand the pain points and the problem points. Um, and, you know, really kind of developing a more, I'd say, a more nuanced sense of what the, both the challenges and the opportunities in the industry uh, uh, might look like. You know, for me, um, I actually was an entrepreneur prior to going to Starbucks. I had a, I had a business in mm. sports and media um, for a few years. And, um, you know, which was an, an interesting experience. I would say it was a middling success, to be, to be quite candid. Um, landed at Starbucks. Wasn't actually sure that I was going to go back to, 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 to being a, an entrepreneur, that is founding a business. But about halfway through my Starbucks tenure, you know, the entrepreneurial mojo started to come back. I think anybody who started a business, <laughs> that, that feeling is pretty familiar, right? You know, the, the nudge, the, the needling, um, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, the, 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 the painful memories kind of recede faster than the joy and the pleasure <laughs> does. And so, like, you know, you kind of forget what you're, what you're actually signing up for. But about 18 months in, entrepreneurial mojo came back. Um, you know, honestly, looking at a guy like Howard Schultz, again, um, um, up close, where you see what it looks like um, for an entrepreneur to have built a business through the lens of who they are and what they care about. I think to me, that was a big, big takeaway from my time there, where mm -hmm. like it precipitated this question in me, right? Like, okay, so, so 
he's done this, like, like what would my version of that be? You know, what are the unique stories, um, yeah, cultural yeah. stories, personal stories, points of perspective that you could bring to bear when you're going to go create a business or, or, or launch a brand? Because ultimately, that is what a consumer brand is, right? I mean, I think there's something that should be Correct. uniquely personal uh, to you when you're bringing that to market. And so, yeah, sort of started on that question. And again, you know, I've, I've you know, been you know, in and out of the US and the UK for 22 years at this point. And, um, you know, as, as it pertains to rum specifically, I walk into any bar in downtown New York um, with a bunch of my friends. And you've seen that over time, um, they, from, from um, their early 20s to late 30s, which is where I am now, um, you've seen that they've been able to kind of elevate their taste over time. If you're a, you're a tequila mm-hmm. drinker today, a mezcal, gin, whiskey, etc., And rum, um, particularly in this market, uh, is so under um, underappreciated and I think so misrepresented mm-hmm. um, to the point of frustration, right? As somebody who, you know, I think has a passion for the spirit and also, of course, is from Trinidad and is from the Caribbean. And so that's kind of, again, the seed that was planted. Like, like, like why, why do people sort of think about rum as this kind of um, pigeonhole? It is a sort of low-end, um, um, low-end spirit. They, they tell me stories of these sugary, slushy cocktails they had on spring break. <laughs> uh, you know, the, the narrative around the category seems to be um, co-opted by pirates and plantations. And like, you know, can you find a way to bring something to market that feels a little bit more elevated, a little bit more contemporary, uh-huh. and definitely a little bit more authentic as well? You know, I say that, you know, when you look at the Caribbean, we don't have any shortage of stories to tell. Right, like, 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 you know, you, you say, well, we have a dearth of like cultural moorings and identity and heritage, and like, and like, like, exactly, it's this crazy, crazy, rich fabric and tapestry. So, so tell those stories instead of whatever folks have been sharing previously, and I think you'll find that 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 again, there's kind of no shortage of opportunity in that vein. And so, really, kind of as a combination of that catalyst, you know, I think thinking more holistically about what it would take to jump back in and become an entrepreneur with finding these specific pain points or opportunities in and around spirits. That kind of led me back, led me back down the rabbit, the rabbit hole. Yeah, and you know, I, I want to say before I jump into my next question, you know, just looking at the way you've pulled the stories and the way you took us through the streets. I mean, not us; everybody hasn't watched it yet. The streets of the Twin Island Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, and and looking at the history of carnival and and the history of slavery and the the history of bootlegging and and bringing that all together. And then roping in the creative economy as a part of that story. I mean, it's just, it's genius for me. And so I, I want to ask you this question. You know, that's the, that's the story part of it. But the engineering part of, of what it is to run a business and the finances, you know, how did the corporate world help you to be a successful entrepreneur today? Um, you know, uh, a, a ton of different ways. You know, I think I think I've been lucky to. I I I often say that like Starbucks, what does selling coffee have to do with rum? What does being a, a corporate vice president have to do with being an entrepreneur? I mean, on the surface, you might say nothing, but I mean, to me, Starbucks was a, was, a, was a really great finishing school for me. It's almost how I think about it. And I had some great foundational experiences before then. I mean, everybody talks about the Starbucks thing now, but you know, I, I um, my first job out of college was at Bain and Company, management consulting. Loved the culture there. Learned a ton. You know, 15 years later, I use a lot of those skills as well. Um, really, kind of turns you into a little bit of a of a corporate athlete. Right. So you can do everything from, you know, um, read a PL to build a model to, you know, build a basic plan um, and what have you. But, you know, coming out of Starbucks, I say actually one of the things that it, 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 it um, fostered in me that's been super useful with 10 to 1 is a sense of brand discipline. Um, I, I think um, mm. it, it's something that is o- overlooked when, um, I mean, I think it's true in any, in any startup, but certainly anything in the consumer space where you have to have a very clear, very pointed view of um, um, what you will and won't do, what you do and don't stand for. Um, and I think there's no way to scale a business to the size of a, of a Starbucks or, or a Nike or, a, you know, kind of pick your, pick your favorite ones without that kind of brand discipline. Yeah. Um, I, don't, I don't know that I had that same level of brand discipline going into it as I did when I came out. Um, uh, you know, three years later. And then, you know, there's things, you know, you, you think about something like uh, to, to kind of move from brand to, to, to operational uh, operational elements, like the nitty gritty of the business. Um, I also ran uh, for Starbucks part of our, our retail business, what we call the retail lobby, packaged coffee, packaged food, merchandise, um, which has a lot of supply chain challenges when you're thinking about how you're moving this inventory across 13,000 yeah. 13, stores in the US. Um, you know, 
<laughs> that introduces a different level of, of paranoia as a, as a leader where you have to think <laughs> about, you know, risk, risk, risk mitigation, making sure things kind of get exactly. there on time or over investing in process. And again, you know, Tento is a, is a tiny, tiny business, but, 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 you know, you look at the supply chain challenges in, in and around spirits, um, um, glass and what have you today. And I think some of those pieces in terms of how you, how you really kind of like raise the alarm before you get to a point where, um, the house is really on fire. Um, I think some of those lessons exactly. from the corporate world, you bring them to the entrepreneurial uh, sphere as well. And they end up being, and end up being quite useful. And, you know, that resonates with me, you know, here being a part of, of BTC, I just never, ever appreciated supply chain until until COVID, the COVID era, right? It's like, you know, you get a better appreciation of how a business needs to run when you don't have the things sometimes to run the business. And so I think you, you speak to that. And, you know, I want to ask this question, you know, what are some of the key elements of being a successful entrepreneur or a small business owner? I think you, you spoke about uh, the, the brand discipline as one of them, but I'm certain that there are some other take out, takeaways, some other nuggets about the key elements that you can give our audience today. To being a successful, a successful entrepreneur. <laughs> um, <Correct. laughs> well, I think, uh, patience? Well, 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 <laughs> patience, resilience, stick to I mean, the list, the list is long. I mean, maybe most importantly is, um, um, never referring to yourself as a successful entrepreneur. I think the, uh, the, the, the journey is long, the road is winding. Um, you know, you're always a work in progress. Um, um, I know that I'm very much a work in progress and trying to sort of build every day and, and get a little bit better every day. Um, but yeah, I mean, to me, I think there's certain pieces of it, right? I mean, again, some of them are known and, and, and fairly obvious. I always tell people, again, if you're gonna, if you're gonna start a business, you're gonna launch a brand, uh, you have to be willing to um, uh, ask yourself if you're willing to tell that story literally one million times, because that's that, that's a number of yeah. times you're going to have to yeah. explain to people sort of where your vision comes from, where the passion comes from, and uh, uh, what sort of business you're endeavoring to build. So, so if you're a little bit iffy on the concept, iffy on the idea, that's probably not the one to invest in. Um, I do think the idea of resilience is obviously important. Um, um, again, it doesn't matter what sort of stories you see in flashing lights on media or social media. Um, I, I, I think it's fair to say that no one has kind of a straight line to success. Um, and so knowing upfront that, you know, you're going to have those pitfalls and really sort of how you bounce back from them, um, how you, how you, you, you know, to me, um, everything affords some opportunity for, for learning, right? So even in those moments where you get told no, or you run into a wall, you, you kind of want to take a step back and say, all right, cool. Well, so how does that affect how I'm going to approach it the next time, right? Am I pivoting the approach? Am I pivoting who I go approach, right? Is there some sort of like kink yeah. in the story that isn't effective or in my operational model? Um, to me, you're in this sort of like never ending iterative loop, right? Um, either where the world provides you feedback or you go out there and you seek that feedback, right? So that you, again, you kind of continue on this path to, to evolution and, 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 and improvement. Um, and I would also say that, um, you know, you want to, somebody said to me, uh, yes, probably eight, nine years ago at this point, that, um, you know, as an entrepreneur, you're trying to find the thing that you can be the best in the world at. Uh, and, mm -hmm. and, and, and I heard that advice and I took it to heart, but I think I actually misinterpreted it initially. Um, but when I, when I heard it, I heard it um, in a, sort of on a, in a very sort of broad type of uh, uh, scale where I said, oh, you know, like, 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 could I build the best sneaker company in the world, right? Um, can I be the best in the world at that? And, and I think over time I've come to realize that definition is, is, is too broad. It isn't whether you could build the best sneaker company or the best rum company. It's actually about, is there a specific perspective that you could bring to that space, a specific story you could tell, a specific lens in that particular vertical that allows you to be the best in the world, right? Like, 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 if you look at ten to one, and, and you sort of, you sort of mirrored it before, um, Darren. Like, like, there's an element of that story that, that no one else can tell, right? You know, some dude it's sitting beautiful. Down in, 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 in in Miami is going to come and offer the same perspective because they don't have the same experience. And so, um, as an entrepreneur, do not undersell the importance of your own experience, your own perspective lean into it with some authenticity and you're going to find people who are willing to believe in that path that you are trying to carve and hopefully give you an opportunity to build it. You know, Mark, when you, when you, you said something just now, you said, you know, when we run into some obstacles, sometimes it's important to step back, right? And I noticed you didn't use the word step out. And I think sometimes we see entrepreneurs step out so quickly 
because in the loop that they're making, they're chiseling at the wall and they're almost there where there is a hole for them to get through and actually be successful, but they step out of it versus stepping back and like getting a perspective. And it reminded me of last year, a speaker said, not every feed, piece of feedback that you get from individuals is necessarily the feedback that you require. Sometimes you have to take what is for you, like a buffet, and leave the negativity at the table. Because, you know, when I, when I, when I watch your, your, um, your story, the one thing that exudes for me is the passion and the culture and the pride that you have for your country, but the connectivity that it has to, 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 to the rum, right? To the spirit. And it makes me want to go into a, 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 a nice restaurant in New York and can I have your finest 10 to 1? Because I feel a particular way about the bottle. I feel, a partic I feel connected to the story. And so I, I just, I think passion is, is so important, as you said. You know, what would you say, you know, talking about that loop and, and, and that step back, what would, you, what, what would be a time in, in your story where you had to step back but not step out? That, that greatest challenge uh, in entrepreneurship, that moment where you know, your hands were up and your back was against the wall. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yesterday, the day before, the day before, the day before, you know, I mean, I think, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, I can, I can, I can give you, we can be here for two hours and I'll give you examples, you know. <laughs> um, um, spirits is a, spirits is specifically is, is, is a very unique, uh, especially in the U.S., a very unique and very difficult uh, um, industry, right? I mean, if you look at sort of the three-tier distribution system where fundamentally you are, you're actually serving three customers. You're, you're, you're trying to get the distributor to sell your product. You're trying to get the retailers or the restaurants, bars, etc., to buy your product, mm. and then you're trying to get the consumer the to, to, to fall in love right. with the consumer product. So, so, so you have three customers. You know, you know, trying to sort of engage one customer is difficult enough. When you're trying to sort of engage three different customers at three different levels, right? It sort of um, it, it, it scales the problem pretty quickly, right? And maybe exponentially. So, um, uh, again, I think that like in that sort of um, in that sort of environment. There's no shortage of no, right? That they, that that you'll hear. You know, I think for us, um, if you are trying to turn a category on its head, we talk a lot about this idea of rum reimagine. Uh, I want to kind of take the way that the average consumer really kind of in the U.S. show up, but but globally, really, right, right, thinks about rum and turn it on its head. Um, more contemporary, more elevated, more authentic. I think if you are trying to sort of um, reimagine a category, um, trying to move mountains. You have a lot of doubt that, that that comes along with that, right? And so people will tell you, no, well, no, 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 not, not, now it's tequila's time, right? Or really we focus on whiskey mm. and vodka hair or, you know, there isn't a consumer who values rum in the way that you value it. I mean, you hear all of that all the time, right? And people can say it very nicely, right? Like, Godspeed, good luck, wish you well, but, you know, don't believe <laughs> in the thing that you're doing. Um, and, uh, you know, if I think about uh, my entrepreneurial journey over the last, you know, decade or so at this point. I think when I used to get that feedback, you, you know, entrepreneurs early in their cycle do a lot of this. You do a, you kind of kind of high amplitude, whipsawing back and forth between the highs and the lows. Somebody gives you a piece of feedback. I talk about these, this idea of feedback pellets. You get a feedback pellet and it takes you to the moon, right? And then somebody kind of tells you next, mm -hmm. next minute, the thing's not working or you can't get the contract, or you can't get an opportunity and then boom. Like, like, like literally, I, I go back to my apartment uh, get in my bed, turn the lights off, and just kind of sit there for a while, right? And so you're sort of you're sort of bouncing back and forth between these 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 sort of emotionally unstable uh, uh, um, nodes, right? And over time, almost like a bipolar it, experience, almost. It is a uh, uh, hundred percent, and I think over time you you come to realize that you can't sort of live and die with every piece of feedback, right? And, and I, I think um, mm -hmm. something you said there to me is totally true. I talk a lot about um. um whether it's great businesses or great leaders or, or what have you, I, I always think in quartiles, like first quartile, second quartile, third quartile, fourth quartile, right? And in other ways, you kind of focus on the first and the fourth quartile and the stuff in the middle and it doesn't really matter, right? First quartile, like, you know, I'm looking at this incredible leader or this incredible business. What are three things that they do that I would want to emulate? If I was going to start a business tomorrow, what are three attributes that person has or that business has that say, yeah, like, like that culture resonates with me or that storytelling or, or, or that approach to leadership. Take those first quartile lessons. 
but don't ignore the fourth quartile lessons either, right? Because because nobody mm-hmm. and nothing is perfect. And I'm really going to get away from this right. sort of framing and putting people on this pedestal where we kind of imagine they have no flaws. Because everybody, everyone can be doing something a bit better. So I would say you also want to look at the fourth quartile um, sort of lessons as well and say, well, what are three things that they are doing? Um, again, business, leader, individual, team, what have you, that I actually don't want to do, right? They offer me some opportunity to kind of pivot my approach and change um, the way that if I had an opportunity, um, I would present this or bring this to market as well. I mean, to me, again, that is sort of like, the, 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 again, the, the, the value of the lessons and the iterative loop that will drive you to success as an, as an entrepreneur. Yeah, you know, I, I I love what you said about the, the 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 quartiles and the fact that you know in the fourth sometimes we are so busy, you know, looking for perfection when in actuality it's not an end state, it's a progression, right? Um, so where does the name ten to one rum come from? I'm gonna give you this joke before you answer this. I, while I was doing the research, I was like, typically I would go when I go to carnival, I'd go to the party at 10 a.m. And I probably wouldn't leave until 1 p.m. And definitely rum would be involved. But I'm certain there's more depth <laughs> to, to the name. So, you know, just give us, you know, tell us where, where does the name come from? 10 to 1 rum. Well, so, so, so first of all, you know, I think that like it's, it's one of the joys of, again, like, like they bring a brand to life and, 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 and hopefully having people kind of make it their own, um, you know. Let it mean whatever you want it to mean in some in, in, in some regards. People, the, the, the two most frequent guesses, the two most frequent guesses are what you just said, time of day, like, you know, 10 p.m. to 1 a.m. or vice versa. Um, odds of success, like 10 to 1 odds for whatever reason. Oh, yeah. um, and then, of course, tri- and of course, Trinis will know, um, you know, the iconic Sparrow song, 10 to 1 is murder. So they often finish off with is murder every time you say 10 to 1. But, but, but mm-hmm. the, 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 the inspiration behind the name actually comes from the original um, um, West Indian Federation, right? Um, which obviously consisted of 10 countries. So, so this idea of, of 10 right. becoming one. Um, and when I'm introducing the story up here in, in, in the US market, I will kind of, I'll often refer to the, the famous Eric Williams quote where he said, you know, ten, um, one from 10 um, leaves not, leaves zero. And I say that the, you're kind of referencing the idea that if you remove one from the collective, the whole thing falls apart. Um, and so if you kind of look at the moorings of 10 to 1 as a brand, it is this idea of community, strength in numbers, the idea that we're all stronger together than we are apart. Right now, that, that, is, that, is, that is to me, when you think about sort of the intention behind 10 to 1 as a, yeah. as a business and as a brand, it has real genuine moorings in some element of Caribbean history, culture, heritage. But it's a message that's applicable, I mean, anywhere in the world, right? I mean, I think you kind of argue, you look around the world today, <laughs> you know, um, stronger together than we are part, strength in numbers, those kinds of messages, I think, are, 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 yeah. are timely and kind of needed anywhere. And so you're trying to create something that I think has some sort of, um, again, personal equity uh, in terms of your, your, your own journey, your own story, but hopefully has resonance on a far bigger stage. And I think, you know, we kind of get some of those nods with the 10 to 1 name. Um, it's, a little, it's a little kind of, if you look at the design on the bottle with the TTO as well, it does reference mm-hmm. Trinidad and Tobago, mm-hmm. that being our country code. So another nice little shout out to um, heritage, Correct. home country, sense of place as, as well. But what I love about what you said, right, is that, you know, you, you have that as the center of that brand, but the 10 to one story speaks to the rest of the Caribbean. Basically, everybody has an involvement or everybody has a has a lean in at some point with, with, with that bottle because it feels a part of you. And the stories are so familiar as well. And that's why I just, I said, when I was watching it, I just, I just loved and enjoyed the passion. So I was educated on it, you know, what it meant after, uh, but really and truly my first guess was I'll start this party at 10 and I'll probably go home at one in the afternoon uh, in, in, in true well, Trini style, right? And you, should, and, you should, and you should still do that. You should still do that with a bottle of I, Because like you said, you gave me license, right? It's my interpretation. So, so yeah, tell me yeah, about yeah. this. You know, you just welcomed Gr- Grammy Award winner and music sensation Ciara as an investor, co-owner and director. You know, what was the motivation for this partnership? Um, you know, it's, it's something that happened pretty organically, to be honest, right? I mean, you, know, 
you look at sort of the, the, the foundational elements of Tanto and some of which we just discussed and, um, you know, it, it, it's not a brand where I said, oh, I need to go get a celebrity and go do X or Y or Z. I think that like, you know, we are trying to lean into storytelling, lean into brand building um, with a fair amount of, of, of intention. Uh, I think I think um, where the Sierra opportunity presented, we have a bunch of mutual friends actually who um, who had connected us. Um, you know, she'll actually say that it's, 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 it's the first, she had just had her third kid, she had been breastfeeding 10 months, et cetera, et cetera. She was given 10 to one as a gift. Um, and it was the first drink that she had, a nice celebratory cocktail that she had after, after mm. her, third, her third baby win was born and was kind of captivated by not just the product, but the story that was tied to it. Um, had a curiosity for spirits. Um, rum was the first thing that she had drunk, like, you know, kind of back in the day, her 21st birthday party. I'm telling some of her story here, but, but there were, there were, there were a lot of kind of serendipitous points of connection. Um, we had a, we had a few conversations and honestly, it was apparent pretty quickly that it would, that'd be a great fit. You know, whenever C and I talk, like we talk about this idea of team, good energy, there's just some very natural resonance in the way that, 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 that she sees the world, the way that I see the world. Uh, I think we can work really well together as partners. And when people sort of ask about her role against the backdrop of 10 to one and everything we've done, well, what I tell them is, um, my ambition, or our ambition is to take um, all those facets of Caribbean history and culture and heritage, you know, uh, that, are, that are in that 10 to 1 bottle and take it to a global stage, right? So, so I, I want to take the story and share it. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm sitting here in New York right now, but you take it to London, maybe you take it to Tokyo and Singapore one day. Um, and if you look at somebody like Sierra, um, two things are true about her. Number one is, if you take a less literal view, it's in, in, in my opinion, everyone can have a different view, but, but in my opinion, take a less literal view of some of the elements of Caribbean culture that we take pride in. I always talk about things like optimism and spontaneity and joie de vivre and, and, and versatility, right? Like, like we have a range, Correct. we can flex, you know? Uh, you know, you're in the office at, you're in the office in the morning, you're in a fete in the evening, right? So, you know, you, 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 have, you have on the blazer right now that we see, you know? Exactly. Like modern oil from from turn the, down right? to so, turn up to turn over. Exactly, and that range to me is so important. Um, and, and, and if you kind of make that checklist of attributes, she actually has those. And so again, like, you know, yeah. you're finding somebody you can identify with your brand, not in a super literal way. She didn't grow up down the street from me, but, but she, can, she, can, she, can, she can amplify some of those same attributes that we think are core um, to 10 to 1. Um, and then of course, related to that, knowing that she speaks to a broader audience, right? Again, like who can help you to export that story? Um, take it to some audiences who haven't maybe seen or heard or engaged with, um, you know, not just what 10 to 1 has to offer, but, but hopefully what we as Caribbean people have to offer. Um, I think there's a massive, massive opportunity for, for, for her to really kind of help us scale the story there. So combination of those things made a ton of sense. Um, we, we, we announced her on 10 1, October 1st last year. It's a lot of fanfare and excitement and I've been excited to keep on building since then. Listen, and, and, I, and I, I even heard another connection 10 months after breastfeeding first drink, you know, there's the 10 to one is coming <laughs> yeah, yeah. in, 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 in so many different right. ways, but right. exactly. And you know, what, what's interesting too, is what I'm hearing from you, you said earlier that you, if you want to be an entrepreneur, you got to be able to tell that story a million times. Right. And it sounds like the, the synergy, it's a synergistic relationship, not just alignment, but synergy, synergies that, as you would say, Ciara can tell your story. Um, a million times because she's also passionate. Um, what I'm hearing about the very thing that you're passionate with in the story of this particular product. You know, I'd say this, uh, you know, when we think about uh, entrepreneurship, we think about the customer experience. What measures do you have in place for a successful customer experience? And like you said, you got three customers, the restaurants, the distributors, and also the consumer. You know, what are some of the measures you've put in place? Um, I mean, yeah, a, a, a ton. Ultimately, if you don't have um, um, consumers, customers who have who have passion for what you're doing um, and willing to not just repeat but also to kind of scale and share that story, then you're not gonna have you're not gonna have too much to work with, right? So, ultimately, customer experience kind of at the heart and soul of any business um, and certainly any brand that you want to go create. Um, you know, we do a host of different things, right? From um, you know 
regular customer surveys. Um, again, my Bain background takes me to things like Net Promoter Score, where you want to just understand how likely somebody is to recommend your product to a friend. That, that, you know, we've, we've been lucky to have very, very high NPS scores. Um, you know, making sure you get feedback on the product, how it's rated, and then there's also more qualitative stuff, right? Like, you know, how it, again in our case. Um, how willing is somebody to kind of pick up that bottle and, 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 and you know, take it to a dinner party, share it with a friend, take it to a fete. Mm -hmm. um, um, it, it's very, very hard to measure anything approaching a viral coefficient in something like spirits in the way that you would in like a, a D2C brand. But you're looking for some, sim, um, some signals and some markers like that as well, right? Um, you know, in a market like New York, you have a, you open up 50 accounts, you open up 500 accounts. And as somebody maybe moves from one venue to another, right? Like, do they sort of place that order for 10 to 1 in that next place as well? So really some of those metrics right. and, and, and markers. But I think, like, 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 I always tell my team that in terms of our approach um, to the, the wider world, um, there's, some, there's, some, there, there's some moorings in terms of the way in which we do business, right? Like, we approach everything with ambition. We approach it with intention. Uh, we, we, we do right by others, even when they don't do right by you. Right, like, like there's a you have a you have a growth mindset. So you kind of arm your team with a set of principles in the way that they are meant to approach the world. Well, something like you know, you know, um, I don't care if it takes them two weeks to follow up. You respond in twenty four hours, right? Like, like let them see that like we're hungry, exactly. we're aggressive, we're ambitious, right? And so you're doing those. You give your team a set of principles that say like this is how we present ourselves to the world. All of whom are your customers, right? Because again, it's distributor, retailer. Correct and consumer, and you kind of see that on repeat, on repeat, on repeat. So I think having that mousetrap as a business, as a brand, um, that cultural mooring is super important. And then looking for those feedback signals, ask them how you're doing, how you can improve, where you can get better, set up the info app to like get that feedback or whatever the case might be. I think we're, we're very invested in that as well. Definitely. And, you know, I'll tell you, sometimes we are so focused on, you know, people who are just high value and, and not recognizing that every customer, given the digital age, has the opportunity to kind of put your products out there because there's TikTok, there's Instagram influencers, there's so many things. I want to jump to some of our questions from our studio audience, as well as some questions that we've gotten virtually. And so, you know, one of the questions is, was when and how did you raise capital uh, to kind of get this business going? Um, yeah, I mean, I raised capital pre-launch. I, I would say almost uh, post-concept pre-launch. So, so I worked on it um, alongside my, my co-founder and good friend, a guy called Zach Waxel, um, who deserves a lot of credit for this as well. But um, I worked alongside Zach for a year and a half. You know, we were kind of sitting on there in the trenches, developing the blend, thinking through the creative, um, you know, all, all of the early storylining that is sent to one was, was written by me, which is why you just kind of hear it sort of over and over again. And you can, you can, you can see it authentically. So it took us a year and a half um, um, of kind of concepting and again, you kind of get to this place where you, 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 you start seeing it to people and you see their eyes light up and you get this piece of feedback from them that says like, yeah, you're, you're, you're onto something there. And so we kind of got, um, you know, to a place where, where uh, you know, people were saying, yo, like, whenever you're ready to launch this business, let us know. We want to participate, right? There was actually a lot of inbound wow. interest. Uh, that came versus going out to market and saying, hey, I'm about to hang a shingle and, and, and raise this capital. So um, we raised money in early 2019, um, you know, launched the brand officially June of 2019, which so is about three years ago at this point. And then we were then we were off. We were off to the races. Then. So I have another question here uh, coming from our virtual audience. What is the benefit or most valuable lesson you've obtained from working for someone and their vision? then making that decision to go on your own and pursue your vision. Say, say that to me again. What's the, what's the lesson I've learned from? What is the benefit or most valuable lesson that you've obtained from working from someone and working on their vision, then making that decision to go after your own vision? Oh, that's, a, that's, a, that's, that's an easy question. That, that, that their vision <laughs> is their vision. And that's, and that's kind of what I was sort of referencing with it. How, how it is a, and I, I, you know, I, I, I reference him um, 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 uh, ubiquitously because, I mean, he's been such an influential um, um, sort of mentor and person in my, own, in my own career, and he's an amazing guy. Um, and it was, it was awesome for three years to be a part of building his vision and telling his story and all of that. Um, and again, gave me a, a bunch of amazing gifts. But then as an entrepreneur, at some point you realize that, like, 
you know, that's someone else's vision and that's their story. So the question you start to ask is, what does it look like to go do that myself? What, what would my vision be? What would my story be? What, what would my outlet for sharing those things with the world be? Whether it's a pair of sneakers or um, a beauty kit or a bottle of rum, right? And, and that to me is a little bit of where, again, sort of like the entrepreneurial seeds start to get planted. And so, yeah, I think, I think that uh, experience was the yin to the yang that then says, all right, I'm gonna go out and do it my own way and do it myself. So, Mark, we're out of time, but I want to give you an opportunity to just give, uh, you know, a final few words to the entrepreneurs that have joined us virtually, uh, those who are in our studio studio audience, just your final words uh, and, and how they should kind of go on and move forward in their own entrepreneurial ventures. Um, sure. Well, I mean, first of all, yeah, thanks so much again for having me. I think, um, you know, uh, great to be a part of, of, of this movement, this groundswell that you guys are clearly at the forefront of, um, which is which is exceptional. I think I think I, I think and I know we need more of these things in the Caribbean for sure. Um, you know, my final thoughts uh, to anybody who's listening out there um, would really just be to kind of give you a, a, a little encouragement and say that you know, um, yeah, the, the road is long, the journey is hard, um, but it is a very gratifying one. Um, and you know, if you kind of invest the right you put in the right investment with the right intention up front, I think you'll see that, that, that good things can happen. And I think specific to, um, to us, to Caribbean people, to me, the big opportunity here is around, I, I think we're at a moment in time now where people have more of an appetite for, for, for authenticity. Um, and and, if, and you know, um, Mia Motley gave a speech, I think it was early in the pandemic, sometime uh -huh. in 2020. Which is, which, which, is, which is to me, um, I'm gonna say it's gospel, but to me it's one of the most impactful speeches I have heard. And she talks about this idea of cultural confidence, which, which you see all, yes, you mm -hmm. see those thumbprints all over 10 to 1. Like, like, like we're, leaning into, we're leaning into a story with a certain level of cultural confidence. We, we are not, we're unapologetic about sort of the lens or the Correct. view, the perspective that we're, that we're bringing to the world. Um, and I think my, my hope is somebody out there listening right now is like, yeah, you know what? Like we do have a story, we do have this richness, right? We do have these opportunities that like we can lean into with a different level of gusto and intention and bring that, um, you know, whether you're talking about sort of a, a local market, Caribbean market, global market, the opportunities are there. And so use that as a key ingredient in however you're going to go approach this next chapter of your entrepreneurial journeys. And again, I think we're going to see that collectively some good things are going to come from this next generation of creators. You know, Mark, they will never want me to get up out of my chair, but I, I really want to get up out of my chair and give you an amazing round of applause for your success and your continuation of success as you move forward. You know, you talk about the four quartiles, you talk about brand discipline and how important that is. And what I've taken home is sometimes your product is not even in a bottle. Your product is yourself and how you discipline your own self and in, in putting yourself out there. And you talk about having that story and making certain that you connect with that story. And you've ended off with us today about cultural confidence. And I, I'm gonna take that home, but one of the other things that resonates with me is, you know, show up as your true self, show up as your authentic mm -hmm. self, be who you are and not attempt to be somebody else because you can only be the best version of yourself. Thank you so much, Mark. I mean, I, I, I'm looking for some amazing things from you. I will continue to follow your work as I'm sure many other individuals who've joined us virtually as well as in studio will as well, and I will go and find a bottle of 10 to 1 and go and have a glass of 10 to 1 at the finest restaurant ever. We wish you every success, all the best there in New York City. Soon to see you here in the Bahamas. Make certain that you stop over here before you head back home over to the Twin Island Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you so much and uh, we'll see you sometime soon. My pleasure. Great to see you, Darren. Uh, thanks, thanks, everyone. Talk all right. to you soon. Take care. So we've heard from someone who's achieved massive success as an entrepreneur. And as we move to our next session, we're going to talk about what you need to do for your business to grow and take off. It is my pleasure to welcome online business coach, Kieran Rose, who with the best tips and tricks on what you need to do to sell successfully online a product and increase your revenue stream for your business. Ladies and gentlemen, here's some more information on Kieran Rose. Introducing Kieran Rose, a.k.a. The Digipreneur. Kieran is a marketing and e-commerce specialist, content creator, and business consultant. 
He is also a Flow Business Brand Ambassador. Based in Trinidad and Tobago, Kieran is known across the region for his commitment to helping Caribbean entrepreneurs build their businesses through his columns, blogs, podcasts, and various other platforms. He is here today to help you find your footing in the digital age so you can pivot to success and grow your business. Let's give a warm welcome to Kieran Rose. Coming to the stage by way of Trinidad and Tobago, he's one of the top thought leaders in the Caribbean region. He works with entrepreneurs in building their digital presence and teaching them how to monetize their platforms. He's the host of the popular Digipreneur FM podcast. And quite frankly, when it comes to navigating the digital age, there is no one better. Please welcome the Digiboss. Mr. Karan Rose. Hello, innovation. How are you guys and gals and lovely people doing today? <laughs> Man, I can't believe, I can't believe they got the Digipreneur following Mark Farrell. How am I supposed to follow that? That whole presentation gave me goosebumps. I was taking notes. I'm supposed to be trying to prepare to talk to you guys, but I'm like, man, forget my notes. I got to take notes too. <laughs> We're all a work in progress. We're all learning. We're, and you know, one thing that Mark said is that, you know, one of the keys to success is never call yourself a successful entrepreneur. Listen, I have that written down, underlined, bold, highlighted, everything. I thought that was genius because we're all a work in progress. And again, I'm supposed to be preparing for you guys and I'm taking notes while listening to his entire thing. So whew, somebody wish me luck as I try to follow up that. But you know what? We got the Digiboss here. We got the Digipreneur here. If you guys enjoyed Mark Farrell, please let me know in the chat. Let me know if you guys enjoyed Mark Farrell. Drop some flames, drop the fire, the fireworks. That's how we're going to know how much you enjoyed Mark Farrell's presentation, all right? So let's get on to what we came to talk about today. Now, if this is your first time joining us at Flow Innovation, we welcome you. We're here to have some fun. Today, we're going to be learning about 10 different digital revenue streams that you could be incorporating into your business to start generating more income online, all right? So let me get started. Let me get this thing set up and let's get right into it because time is of the essence. We are not here for a long time, but we are here for a good time. Now, let me kick that off, all right? Do, 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 do. All right, so let's go. The world of digital monetization. If you guys are ready for this, please drop some flames. I got to drop a bomb too. Drop some flames in the chat if you guys are ready. I can't wait to get, to get this thing started. So we got some key presentation points for this session. First, if this is the first time where you guys are hearing about me, Karen Rose, I'm going to give you guys five fun facts about me. Then we're going to move into the importance of creating multiple streams of income. I know it's pretty self-explanatory, but I got to touch on it, right? And then we're going to move into the digital monetization case study. I love telling stories. I love reading stories. And I figured I'm going to teach you guys about digital revenue streams via a story so you can see how everything works together, all right? And then we're going to move into the Q&A. So five things about me. I'm going to do this quick because I want to get into the good stuff. Number one, you're hearing an accent. You're probably wondering, where on earth is this guy from? Well, I was born in Trinidad and Tobago, and I moved to Toronto when I was literally two weeks old. I was born here, and my mom shipped me to Canada. We moved to Canada where I froze to death for 28 years of my life. I then moved back to Trinidad in 2013 to give myself a change of pace. And I'm glad that I did it. Third, my two favorite jobs uh, to this day that I've ever done has been working at Telus Communications and Apple. Apple being the, the job and the company that has just, re, um, just helped me reimagine the things that I do and how I do it in today's, in today's day and age for myself. 
Some books that have helped me get started in my entire entrepreneurial journey and have helped me get the skills that I need to be a digital marketer and an online business coach is The Key Person of Influence by Daniel Priesty. That is like my entrepreneurship Bible. I read that book once a year because, again, it's so practical, tangible, and it's an entire blueprint for you to build your brand online. And as long as you're doing those things that he talks about in the book, you're going to put yourself in good shape. And second book is Crushing It by Gary Vaynerchuk. I think the best part about Crushing It was that it just sets you in the mindset to really understand how to do digital, building your digital presence and the importance of creating content and the doors that it can open up for you. Last but not least, the reason I love digital entrepreneurship is that it gives those who don't have all of their finances together a chance to get started. It also provides you with time and freedom location. And if that's not, you know, a great reason to start your own business, especially a digital business, one that is online, then I don't know what else is. All right. So let's get moving. So why multiple streams are important. So again, this is just a heartful reminder because I know we know things are hard. Things are expensive. We need more money, right? So number one, for starters, you will have more than one way for your business to earn. I think one of the big problems that people run into is they try to start multiple businesses at the same time when they haven't even built their first successful business. So the things we're going to be talking about today is how to create multiple different streams of revenue within your one business, but from the digital landscape. All right. Second, you want your business to maximize on all of the opportunities available to you. There are so many opportunities in the digital space. And here in the Caribbean, we're not nearly taking advantage of enough, but that's mainly because all of it is so new to us. So that's okay. If you haven't been taking advantage of it, this is exactly why flow innovation is happening. So we can start to plant those seeds across the entire Caribbean and eventually you know, a year from now, or maybe even less, we're going to start to see people implementing a lot of these things and generating digital streams of income in their business. Um, it also protects your business so that when one of your streams uh, starts to slow down, you have others to keep you going. Listen, the pandemic hit and my main source of income was evaporated overnight. And if it wasn't for the other things that my business was doing, some of the other digital revenue streams, you know, it would have just been tough all around. So again, this is another reason why you want to have multiple streams of revenue. And digital streams allow for passive income and don't always require your physical presence, which is absolutely great. Nothing like waking up in the middle of the night to go get a glass of water and you're getting emails that you have been paid or a new client has been booked. All right. Splendid. Now, this is a quote that I want you to really take in, internalize, if you will. I want you guys to start thinking about how you could take your passion or your expertise and find your audience's desires or pain points and solve them. Look at what you are passionate about. And sometimes we might not know what we are passionate about, or we might not have a passion for things that are business related. However, you either have to look at your passions or look at the things you are good at. Find your audience's desires and their pain points. And if you can solve that, that is the starting point for your business. Okay? Let's, let's dive into the case study. Let us dive into the, who is ready for the case study? Who is ready to learn about the digital streams of revenue? Please, I need some feedback. Drop some flames in the chat. Please, where is Bounty Killer? Bang, bang, bang. I need some flames in the chat. Who is ready to let's get this monetization case study, this story started? Let me know in the chat. Drop some flames. All right. Wonderful. <laughs> Connell says, me, flames. Luke says, I like that. More flames are coming in. It's nice. So we're going to meet Naomi, the skincare specialist. All right. 
And I got to turn my AC up because it's going to get hot in here. Meet Naomi, the skincare specialist. So this is the starting point of Naomi's journey. I want you guys to picture yourself in Naomi's shoes. Because I know many of us are the Naomi in this story. All right. Naomi wants to build a brand. I mean, who does it, right? Naomi is constantly getting complimented and asked about her skincare routine. She decides to start a side business in a niche that she loves, skincare. All right? Many of us have been in that, in that role where we do something, we like it, we decide, you know what, maybe we could turn this into a business. The journey for Nye begins. You see, Naomi used to have, really have bad acne for most of her life, which aided in her self-consciousness. She would keep herself in a box and out of sight until one day she decided she had enough. She started to put herself through her own skincare journey. In six months, her acne was gone and her skin was flawless. Here begins Naomi's journey into building Face by Nye. As we go through this story, I want you guys to take notes of all the different ways that we can monetize. Here goes the story of Naomi. Naomi started with a blog. She knew she wanted a digital home that would be a safe space for women that suffered as she did with acne and everything that comes with it. So one, she learned how to do market research and started creating blogs around the top questions that women asked about acne. This allowed her blog to gain traction really quickly because she ranked on Google's first page for the top questions about acne with her blog. She learned about Google AdSense, hint, hint, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, folks. She learned about Google AdSense and decided that she would add it to her website. This allowed her visitors to click on ads and the website, and she started to get paid by Google AdSense. Now, I'm going to give you guys a market research sample. These are some of the things that we need to learn as entrepreneurs to really dominate the digital space. So again, Maybe uh, Naomi has reached out to the Digiboss and we sat down together and we did some market research together. Let's take a look and see what we found. So looking at skin, the word, the keyword skin in Jamaica, we found out that skin was Googled 720 times in the last 30 days in Jamaica. But here's what's really interesting. Take a look at the searcher's angel searchers age range 62 percent of the people who searched for skin in jamaica were between the ages of 25 to 34 while the rest was between 35 to 44 now all research we can type in any topic any keyword any product any problem and we can get the volume amount of how many times it was searched for in a specific country, we can also get the entire age ranges of the people searching for particular things. And that will help us craft our ads, craft our products, craft our services, all right? Next up, we looked at where are the people located in Jamaica searching for the word skin? So just imagine we're learning how to do market research putting in our product services, the top problems that are in our space. And we can see everywhere in the world people are located that are conducting that search. So for Jamaica, skin has been searched for number one, Hanover Parish, number two, Trelawney, number three, St. James, four, St. Thomas, five is Clarendon. Boom, 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 come Knowing this information, we can do targeted ads. If we wanted to do offline activities, this would be a great place to start to do offline activities, looking for where are the places in our countries that are doing the searches for our particular products or services in our related space, all right? 
Then we took a look at what are the top questions being asked around skin in Jamaica over the last 30 days. There were 392 questions asked about skin. So remember, Naomi started off with the website. She started to blog about the top questions in her space, and that allowed her to rank a number one on Google and position her business or her brand as the top space on Google, right? So we looked, she's seen things like, are skin tags contagious? Are skin tags dangerous? Are skin cancers itchy? Can skin recover from steroid cream? Can skin cancer spread? These are all things related to the word skin that Jamaicans asked in the last 30 days. All right. So these are the types of research that we want to do so that we understand what is happening in our industry. That way we can create the right content, the right products, the right service, and the right messaging. Can I continue? Please drop some fires in the chat. Let me know if I can continue. All right. Because now we are back to the story. Naomi's audience started asking for how to's. Since her audience wanted more visual content, she got into creating how to videos. People wanted videos and Naomi thought it would be best for her to start a YouTube channel. This would allow for people to continue to search on Google for the top questions about skincare and her blogs and now videos would show up as a result. Since she already had a Google AdSense for her website, she knew that she just needed to get 1,000 followers and 4,000 hours of watch time for YouTube to start paying her. Again, hint, hint, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Make sure you're making your notes on the monetization. 1,000 followers, 4,000 hours of watch time for YouTube. Within three months, she was able to achieve the requirements and start collecting YouTube checks. And newsflash, everybody, the entire Caribbean is able to monetize YouTube. They can deposit the funds, direct deposit into our local bank accounts. You can set that up through Google AdSense, or you can have Google mail you out a physical check. All checks from Google are in U.S. dollars. If you're doing direct deposit, direct deposit goes into our local bank accounts on the 22nd of every single month. Naomi then hits social media. So she's armed with a popular blog and YouTube channel. Naomi starts to create shorter pieces of content from her long form pieces of her blog and her videos. It takes Naomi six months to reach 6,000 followers on social media, but her audience is super engaged. Guess what? Companies start noticing that her engagement rate is one of the best in her country, in her niche. Brands begin reaching out with sponsoring products for her to review and invite her for social media takeovers. Naomi starts receiving payments for the product review she is doing and is also being paid for the, for the takeover events that she is a part of. I have to say that is, that is brilliant. Then people say, Naomi, well, all those products you keep talking about, where can I buy the products, Naomi? This question keeps popping up all over Naomi's social media. So Naomi decides to sign up with Amazon affiliates. And every single time she talks about a product, she gives people the option to click on her affiliate link. Every time someone purchases her recommendations, she makes a commission from the, from the affiliate link on Amazon. And yes, folks, Amazon pays us in U.S. dollars and they do direct deposit into our bank accounts using a service called Payoneer if you sign up or they can mail you out the check as well. Number two, Naomi has a bright idea that she would begin selling some of her own branded products on her website. She scours AliExpress for products that she really loves and begins white labeling products for sale on her website. She begins using drop shipping as a means to get her products to her audience. And for those who might not know what drop shipping is, that's when you handle the marketing, you have a drop shipping partner who handles the labeling, the manufacturing, and the shipping of the products. So once you sell the products, they receive the order. 
You make your money, you pay for the product, you get the wholesale price, and they would handle the delivery of the product to your audience anywhere in the world. AliExpress is one of the top drop shipping partners, but there's many more. You guys can jump on Google and learn about the different drop shipping partners, all right? But AliExpress is one of the biggest. Then people are people start to ask Naomi. We want organic recipes, Naomi. We want the organic stuff. Naomi decides to heed the call for the recipes for the organic mixes that she prepares in her videos. She decides to create an ebook with her secret recipes that she has kept close to her heart. And she starts selling the ebook on her website and on Amazon. All right. Hint, hint, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, right? We're talking digital streams of revenue. Naomi is now the number one organic skincare specialist in Jamaica. She is the top shot at any yard. She decides it's time to open up an exclusive place for people that are interested in building themselves up as skincare specialists. Naomi opens up her membership website and certifies specialists in organic skincare remedies that she has created. Ooh, I got to take some advice from Naomi. I got to make notes of this too. <laughs> but guess what? Naomi's still growing. She's still building. The audience wants more. There is a hunger for more. We want more Naomi. They go to Naomi and they say, Nay, we love your voice. Naomi's community believes she is an inspiration and they love to hear her talk. She decides to create a safe space for women to be able to listen to the stories of other women. She launches her podcast and then signs up for Patreon. This allows women to support her podcast via the don donations. And because she has the podcast, companies whether they're big or small, also reach out to advertise in the podcast or sponsor the podcast. Oh, God, I got to take notes, too. <laughs> and at this point, Naomi has grown. This girl is bad. She is the top shutter in Jamaica, and she's a big dog in the Caribbean. Naomi has helped hundreds of thousands of women build their confidence, and she has now decided to give her community yet another way for them to identify themselves as a part of the community. Naomi has now started to create designs with her top quotes, her logo, funny comics, and put them on merchandise. My goodness. She works with a platform like Printful or Teespring to create designs and deliver the products to her community all over the world. Well, Naomi, I, I learned that too. I got to hustle and motivate hats. I had to go get the Digipreneur hoodies. But Naomi, I'm taking notes too, Naomi. I'm taking notes too. So then, guess what? Naomi then takes the stage. Naomi has built up quite the story along the way, and that has now opened the door for her to do paid speaking gigs about her journey and be on panels as a skin care expert. Naomi, listen, I have got to take notes because that's a great idea. I got to start getting paid and doing workshops too. <laughs> so... That is the story of Naomi, and that is to be continued because who knows, maybe next innovation, Naomi might be doing some other major things, and she might come back with more ways to monetize and build her digital presence and make digital shmoney. Did you guys count all the ways? Well, let's see how many ways we got to monetize. So there are a multitude of ways, but here are some of the core ways that were brought up in Naomi's story. Now, remember, you might have heard these things and thought of other ways, right? And that's amazing. But here are the core ways we spoke about in the story. Number one is Google AdSense. This allows you to monetize your Google ads on your website, but also your YouTube videos as well. Number two, e-digital products. Create eBooks or downloadables that you can sell on your website or on Amazon. You can also partner with Teespring or Printful to create your own merch line. And again, they're going to be delivering the merch all across the world. Three, social media. 
Think about product reviews, social media shout outs, IG page takeovers or sponsored posts from companies and brands. That's a great way to monetize, right? Um, number four, a membership site. Membership websites are great for recurring income and to create an exclusive community. Number five, affiliate marketing and drop shipping. So all those times people are asking you, hey, where did you get that shoe? Where did you get that shirt? Heck, when people even ask me basic things like, hey, where did you get that book? Or where did you buy them all toys? Listen, I'm sending everybody Amazon affiliate links. I'm trying to make commission off of every single thing people ask me because we give away all of our stuff, all of our advice for free. Sign up for Amazon affiliates, send out your affiliate links and make some commission. That's a good way to make some recurring income in the background. Then we got the podcast. Shout out to Digipreneur FM, shameless plug. <laughs> we got the podcast. You can register with Patreon and get paid or sell ad space on your podcast to brands or businesses or have them sponsor episodes, right? And then we got speaking gigs. Paid speaking gigs will open up to talk about how you built the business and you're going to be able to sit on expert panels with other industry experts. And when you do these things, when you create the content, you create the podcast, you do the blog, the YouTube channel, when you do all of these things, right, it just builds your name and you're going to be able to get people to directly do business with you, but it also creates distribution channels so that when brands or other businesses say, hey, we want to sponsor something, you have things that you can sponsor. You can sponsor an episode on your podcast. You can do targeted ads or sell ad space on your website and create links back to the sponsors' websites or products that they can track so that you can measure how successful was the, uh, the campaign. Do not just limit yourself to social media. Why? Because you don't own social media, right? We've seen tons and tons of influencers and popular businesses get their platforms restricted, removed, copyright infringement, you name it, because they don't own the platform. So get things like your blog, uh, your, your podcast, platforms that you own, that way you have full control over doing that, all right? So you're probably thinking about where are some places that I could learn to get some of these skills to implement some of these things, right? So one of my recommendations is Google Digital Garage. Now, everything that I have learned, I never learned all of my e-commerce, marketing, SEO. I never learned none of these skills to teach it. I actually learned all of these skills for my business, Droid Island. And then because I got so good at building Droid Island digitally, more people started to come to me asking me about, hey, forget them phones. Who did your website? How are you showing up on Google? How are you getting all of these gigs? How are you showing up on, on Google search, on Bing? When more people started to ask me how I was building my business, and I found myself teaching a lot more about the how I built the business, at that point, I made that switch. So Google Digital Garage is a great way to get started. Learn skills like digital marketing, paid advertising, how to build an online business, building self-confidence online. Oh yeah, that's actually a course in Google Digital Garage. Growing your business in other markets. Again, that's also a course on Google Digital Garage. Second space is HubSpot Academy. You can learn skills such as content marketing, search engine optimization, managing customer relationships, email marketing, and much more. Anybody following me on social media, especially on Instagram, knows that I share almost every single thing I'm doing business-wise in my Instagram stories. So when I'm doing when I'm doing courses, heck, there are courses I've spent over a thousand US dollars to do. And I'm there giving behind the scenes and giving tips so that people can see what is going on and learn with me. My Instagram stories have all of that type of content, right? So Learn things from HubSpot. I did a bunch of courses over the long weekend here in Trinidad. Some of them were in HubSpot Academy, all right? Then we got Skillshare. Skillshare has a wide variety of skills to learn from business to creative skills. So if you're thinking about, it, man, I don't know how to edit video. I don't know how to do videos on my smartphone or take pictures on my smartphone. Skillshare has tons of courses 
creative courses, and business courses on Skillshare. Check out Skillshare, sign up for those courses, elevate your skill sets, all right? So I think we can move into the Q&A now because I know we got some time. So drop those questions into the chat. I know my flow team got me. They're going to be putting in the chat the, 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 uh, the question so that I can see it. I'm going to be looking at the feed too. So if you got questions, please drop your questions in the chat. Let's get these things answered. Let's see how best we can help you. And while the questions are coming in, you guys can also screenshot this. You guys can follow me on social media. It's Karen Rose everywhere. LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, TikTok. Email me, check out the website, karenrose.com. Or if you're in a podcasting, check out the Digipreneur FM podcast. All right. So the first question is, how do we access the Google data you were showing? Now, Carnal, Flow Team, let me know. Should I do a live example or should we save this one for a whole workshop and show people how we could do market research? <laughs> because really and truly, the Google data is an entire workshop. So let me give you guys an example, right? Let me show you guys one of my favorite free tools. That is Google Trends. So Google Trends collects all of this data that the humans put into Google search, right? If you go in Google Digital Garage, there is actually an entire course on how to do Google Trends. It is one of the ones that I recommend all the time because as a free tool, Google Trends does some amazing things. So for one, when we click on Explore, we're going to see this page come up, right? And look at our filters. We can look at the entire world so we can get data from the entire world or put in a specific country. And then we could change the duration. Do we want to look at data from the last five years, 12 months, 90 days, 30 days, right? And again, this is just a quick example. On the left-hand side for search topics, that's Google algorithms compiling all of the searches that humans put into Google search and grouping it into parent topics. And on the right-hand side, search queries, that's the actual uh, terms that humans put in and Google just tallies it up, right? So left-hand side is Google's algorithm combining everything to key topics. The right-hand side is the, is the actual words, right? So if I change this right now to Jamaica, right? And I put in jerk. This is going to show me the top cities. Well, for one, are people searching for jerk in Trinidad? I mean, in, in Jamaica, and it's going to give you the history of the search. Then it's going to show you things like these are the top cities or the top parishes that are searching for jerk in Jamaica. So now this is going to help with your Google ads. It's also going to help help with your Facebook ads. And then if you scroll down some more, you're going to get some related topics. So people are looking for sweet word jerk. So clearly when I go to Jamaica, I got to go check out sweet word jerk because it's top of the list. And then there are people looking for ultimate jerk center, Kingston jerk. That's good. So you want to make a long list of all the products, services in your industry and run it through Google Trends so you can see are people searching for it because many businesses are creating products and services for things that people don't want. And even though they don't want it or they don't know about it, that means you're going to have more marketing to do. You're going to have to spend more money doing ads to get in front of them versus if you know people are looking for it and where it's going to, you don't have to spend as much money because you're going to be able to have your website, you know, do your research on what they're searching for, the key topics, key questions, and then create the right content and show up in organic search. But if nobody's searching for the things you're putting out, then you're going to not, you're not going to get any traffic from organic search and you're going to have to spend a lot of money on paid search. And I don't know about you, but when I started out, me was too broke. I was too broke to do paid. <laughs> All right. So then someone said, can you share a bit more about Amazon affiliates? All right. No problem. So check this out. Right. So let's just say someone says, yo, Karen, um, you just spoke about big shout out to my girl, Dr. Terry Carell, read out of Jamaica. You were just highlighting Dr. Terry Carell's book. Where did you buy it? I want to buy it. All right. Cool. No problem. I'm going to go on. I'm going to go on Amazon. I'm going to pull up Dr. Terry Carell. Right, or I need to put in her last name. Hold on, let me get it. Let me get it right. Let me get it right. 
Amazon, Amazon, Amazon's hating. Hold on, hold on, hold on. All right, let me just pull up. Um, let me just pull up anything. All right, I'm gonna grab this book, right? So I grabbed this book. Then what I'm gonna do is on the top, there's Amazon Associates, right? So in order to get this site strip, what you need to do is go to Amazon Associates, right? Amazon Associates Central, create your account with Amazon Associates, right? So go through the process, go through the registration. Once you do that, then you're going to have an account and you're going to get the Amazon Associates site stripe. So then you're going to type in any product that you're talking about and you're going to be able to get the text link the image link or the text and image link. So once I get this link now, I can copy and paste it and embed it in a blog, embed it in YouTube or send it to people. And once people click on the link, then I would earn a commission from that product. Every product on Amazon has different categories and each category pays a different percentage. All right. So that's a bit about how the Amazon affiliates work. All right. Someone asked, what is the name of the e-digital product site that you mentioned? So um, for the e-digital products, um, I basically was talking about Amazon, getting your digital products on Amazon to sell your eBooks, or you could use your website to sell eBooks. If you were talking about drop shipping, right? The drop shipping partner I mentioned in the story was AliExpress. AliExpress is one of the top drop shipping partners, but again, jump on Google, Type in drop shipping partners and then see the reviews because there's a wide variety of drop shipping partners all across the world that you're going to be able to leverage and use. All right. So let's see what else, what else, what else? Um, do, 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 do. Yeah. Keep the questions, keep the questions coming. Keep the questions coming. Let me see what else you guys got. All right. This is such, listen, I love these sessions because not everybody's going to be able to talk to a Mark Farrell. So shout outs to Flow Business for bringing in a Mark Farrell, giving us some great tips on how to build our business. All right. And then we got this type of workshop because these are going to be showing things that people might not have seen before. All right. All right. So a question comes in. What's the one thing I should do to get started? If I was to choose one thing. All right. So the most important thing I tell everybody, the starting point for building your digital presence. And if you realize everything comes back to your digital home, that is your website. That is the most important piece of the entire puzzle because check this out, right? Let's say I go to Google and I say, how do, how do I fix lower back pain, right? Look at what comes up. The entire page is filled with links to somebody's website, right? 68% of all sales start with a Google search. So if you do not have a website, then you are not participating in the number one way that everybody shops and also does the research and get information. And if I cannot Google you or Google a pain point or Google a desire, and you don't show up on, on, on Google's page one, then your competitors are going to get my business. Your competitors are who I'm going to build trust with. We don't use people's first point of contact is not social media. It's Google. We have a problem, a desire, we Google it, and then we do our research from there. All right. So that's the starting point is your website. Get your website done, right? Flow business builds websites. So if you need someone to build an e-commerce website for you, you can let them know in the chat. The flow business team will take your information or send you the link to go and register and a, and a sales rep will be in contact with you. And then if you want to build a site on your own, look at platforms like a WordPress, a Shopify, a Wix. Look for platforms that allow you to get paid in the Caribbean, all right? Um, next up, uh, skills, the websites to build the skills. Okay. No problem. Let's take a look at that real quick. These are the sites to go and learn how to build skills. Number one, Google digital garage. Number two, HubSpot Academy. Number three is Skillshare. So look at key courses like digital marketing, 
paid advertising, how to build your business online, building self-confidence online, learn things like content marketing, search engine optimization, managing customer relationships, and email marketing. Those are key courses that you're going to be using in every aspect of building your, your business online. For e-commerce, selling online, and also the marketing, but also managing your relationships and creating content. All right? All right. And da, 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 I think this is the last question before we wrap up. All right. Da, 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 da. Okay. No, we got two more questions. So what about service-based companies? How can we make money using those awesome strategies? So that's a great question. So I'm a service-based business. So I do market research for companies. I also do SEO behind the scenes for companies and their websites, right? So as a service-based business, one of the number one things that I do is I create a lot of content on strategies. So let me just give you guys a little preview of my LinkedIn, right? If you are not on LinkedIn and, and using LinkedIn, LinkedIn is the number one place where 99% of all my business as a service-based business, I get my business from LinkedIn because LinkedIn is the only platform in the world where guess what? I could type in, like, look at this, right? I could type in flow. Look at this, right? I could type in flow and flow. I could search for as a company, right? I could search for flow as a company or I got to put in, hold on, let's put in flow business. So I could search for flow business as the company. And then I could see the people that work there, right? I can find out the people that work there. And then you can directly contact the CEOs, you can directly contact the, the hiring managers, the people in positions of power that you're going to be able to do business with. So that's one reason, that's one way I get business. Using LinkedIn, contacting companies, people who need my products and services, right? And contacting them. But check this out. When we go on my LinkedIn platform, again, I'm a service-based business. I create a lot of content educating about strategies. So when people see the content, when they see the strategy that I'm talking about, businesses will reach out and say, Hey, you were just talking about TikTok for business. Um, can we, can I message you? Can I call you? Can I book a session with you to get some of that stuff done? All of the content that I pull out is all strategy related. So people can see it and then reach out to me. I'm talking about strategies to get jobs, utilizing digital tools and strategies to get jobs. Every single thing ties back into my business. So look at this, right? The job landscape in Trinidad and Tobago. Check this out. I did this slide deck yesterday, and this is a market research. So learning the skills that I spoke about gives us access to, to data like this. I took all of the job websites in Trinidad and Tobago, put them together, and was able to rank who is getting all the traffic. Number one is Caribbean jobs, two Trinidad jobs, three jobs TT, and then I'm showing this to the recruitment agencies because I'm like, hey, recruitment agencies, you guys are not doing a good job on digital. You're getting your food eaten by the other places. You guys can reach out to me and I can help you take some of this market share back. But I quantified it with the data that I was able to get. Look at this. I'm able to take all of those websites. So all 12 of the websites that we looked at and broke down. Look at the ages of the people visiting the websites and the genders of people visiting the websites. That way you can craft your strategies and you know who you're targeting. Then I was able to see the top links on their website generating the most traffic. And what are the top keywords people are typing into Google that's bringing traffic to their websites, right? And then we can see the age ranges and the search volume for particular words, and then the, uh, the, the location of where these people are located. So as a service-based business, I'm all about creating content strategies, showing how my products or services can help you solve a problem or achieve a desired result. I put that out on LinkedIn and that's what I do, right? That's how I get business. So folks, I just want to thank you. I want to thank you for coming to Flow innovation. This second edition has been great. We still have the pitch competition coming up next week. We still got more for the rest of today's, uh, today's uh, session. If you guys need to follow up with me, ask me questions or reach out again, uh, reach out on LinkedIn, Instagram, TikTok at Karen Rose, check out the podcast, Digipreneur FM. 
or go to karenrose.com, check out the blogs. It's all about learning how to build your digital presence and monetizing your platforms on all of my channels, right? And that is how I help you. So that's it from me, please. <laughs> that's it from me. Have yourself a wonderful, wonderful rest of the session. If you enjoyed today's session, please drop some flames in the chat. Let Flow Business know that we had fun. Let me know how we did. Drop some flames. That will let me know how well we did today. And that's it for me today, folks. Have yourself a, rest, a, a wonderful day. Take care, everybody. <laughs> I don't know about you, but Karan, I, I am going to become a digipreneur. I'm going on Amazon Associates. I'm going to be able to refer people. I'm going to get my website sorted out. So many different opportunities I think Kiran was able to speak to us about. So I just want to say thank you for such an informative workshop. I mean, I love hearing Kiran speak about upskilling yourself for this digital age. He makes it sound extremely easy, which I know, uh, you know our very busy small business owners will be able to appreciate that you need to be able to have that training, have that skill, and just make it happen like Nike, just do it. So through our innovation events, we're showcasing business owners from various backgrounds who've seen success in growing through digital tools and technologies. And that's the case with our next guest speaker, CEO of Jamaica-based QuickCart, Monique Powell. She's joined in conversation with TV host and journalist, a very, very good friend of mine. And I think she's a digit, no, I know that she's a digipreneur as well. And if you ever, well, if you had the opportunity to attend her wedding, let me just tell you, <laughs> wedding of the century. So I have to get used to calling her not Ianthea Smith, but Mrs. Ianthea Ferguson. A special thank you to our partners at Tech Beach uh, Retreat for showcasing Monique and her business journey today. So let's just take a look at what Monique, who Monique is and what she's all about. Introducing Monique Powell, founder and CEO of QuickCart. This Jamaica-based online delivery service offers convenient delivery of food, groceries, and more from a variety of restaurants and stores across Kingston and Montego Bay. Over the past six years, Monique, a powerhouse businesswoman and entrepreneur, transformed her company from QuickPlate, which focused only on food delivery, to QuickCart which gives customers easy access to a much wider variety of products. She's here today to help you learn how to transform your business for the digital age. A hearty welcome to Monique Powell. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I don't know about that intro Darren just did for me, <laughs> but he is definitely a good friend of mine. So thank you so much. I am delighted to be here today. My name is Ianthea Ferguson, TV host and journalist, and I'm joined by Monique Powell, CEO of the Jamaica-based e-commerce and logistics provider, Quick Heart. Monique, welcome. Thank you so much for being with us. Hi, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure being here. Now, the gentlemen, Darren and Mark and Kiran, have literally set the stage for us today. Now, we ladies, we got to hold it down in this 15 to 17 minutes that I have with you today. So we're going to just bring some energy, bring some life, and of course, all of the amazing business advice that you can share with us today. So I started to do a little digging when I heard that I needed to interview today. And I'm like, who is Monique Powell? Who is this woman? And what do I need to know about her? And one sentence that I found or I read, um, in an interview that you did, it said that you are a tenacious woman who loves the building things and putting pieces together. So talk to me a little bit about your business, how you started it and how you pieced this together. Right, so QuickCart is an online platform that allows people to browse through listings of restaurants and stores that are in their area. They can shop online, add items to their cards, add meals to their cart, check out online, pay online, and have it all delivered to their doorstep, usually within an hour or so. So we are, I suppose you could call us in a sense, the Uber Eats of, 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 of Jamaica, in a sense. Um, so that's what we have been focusing on building out. There is more to come that falls a little bit outside of the scope of what we have become known for, um, but it, it builds upon the expertise in logistics and e-commerce that we've been de delivering, developing over the years. And another thing I read about you was that you, as a, as a kid, you would bring 
computer parts or ship computer parts from the United States and sell them in your hometown. So you started out early in your entrepreneurship journey. So talk to me a little bit about that tenacity and just the will to continue on in your journey. Yeah, so I think I've always been entrepreneurial. So like you said, um, there was a time as a teenager when at that time, it wasn't like nowhere you can walk into any store and buy a computer, or computer parts or accessories. They were pretty hard to get back then. So, you know, I started bringing them in from abroad, selling them back for a profit. Um, I also started my own web design business at around 17, there about. Um, so even though I eventually got into the corporate world, um, I got a job offer at about 18 from a client that I had had as a web design client. Um, and that was kind of how I got started in the corporate space. I always had that in me and I always knew that at some point in the future, I would eventually go out and, and start my own business. And, and so that proves to us then that you, you're not new to this entrepreneurship world, you're true to this, right? So talk to us about some of the elements of being a successful entrepreneur and what can we as small business owners do just to ensure that our companies survive? Yeah, yeah. So one of the things that I want to say is that I am still figuring out what it takes to become a successful entrepreneur. Um, I don't think it's something that you ever master. Uh, you know, they say new level, new devil. So every time the business grows a little bit, every time you increase the number of employees you have, you increase the scope of the business, there are new challenges that you've never had to deal with before that you have to learn how to navigate. So I feel like it's something you never truly master. Um, so I'm not sure I can tell people how to be a successful entrepreneur, but what I can share are a couple of things that I've learned along the way in my journey. So one of the things I'd recommend to new entrepreneurs, and I mean, you know, those within, let's say, year one to three, uh, start building out your team as early as possible. So, you know, there is the tendency to want to save as much money as you can in the early stages of the business when you're probably not profitable yet, you're probably still figuring out product market fit. So you say, okay, let me do as much as possible by myself. And for the first maybe two and a half years or so of the business, I only had one employee. Um, and uh, a lot of people on the outside wouldn't know this because uh, we we're doing hundreds of orders per week. You know, we had a bunch of partner merchants, that kind of thing. But what it meant was that I was accounting, marketing, finance. I was doing a lot of, carrying a lot of the functions of the business. And uh, what I realized now in hindsight was that if I had invested in getting a couple of additional team members early in the process, it would have propelled us much further along. Um, so the tendency to want to save money by doing more yourself is actually a counterproductive thing. And, and you know, if I could go back, that's one thing I would do differently. So that's something I'd like to share with people. Start building out, to start investing in building out a team from as early as you can. Um, and you said it. Another thing. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, continue. <laughs> continue. So I was about to say the other thing now has to do with understand early on what will be required to build a business. Especially if it's a business that goes beyond just, you know, running a personal consultancy or solopreneurship. Um, it's a business that requires you to manage employees early on, requires you to manage a number of processes and, and, and so forth. Um, ensure that when you're going into it, you understand that it will probably be one of the hardest things you ever do. Um, so it's important to ensure that you have support around you, that you tell your friends, you tell your family members that this is something that is, I'm doing that is going to be very hard for me. And uh, if you can support me in any way, if you can assist me in any way that I'm struggling, please do. I will need the help. 
And it's also important to take care of yourself. And this was another thing that I, I learned in hindsight. Um, because again, you know, we had one employee outside of um, delivery contractors for the first couple of years. I found myself working seven days per week and I felt, I'd feel guilty about taking time off because there was so much to be done. And what I eventually realized is that you're no good to the company if you're burnt out. So understand that it's going to be difficult and that there's not much you can do about that. So you might as well pace yourself and take care of yourself throughout the journey. And I love that part of the advice that is so important for people who are building their businesses. So you are a black Caribbean woman in tech. That, that is to be lauded itself. Um, talk to me a little bit about the challenges that you've faced growing a quick cart. Uh, it's, I think a lot of it has to do with um, the business. So firstly, there is a business environment um, and the infrastructure in Jamaica. And I gather that in some other Caribbean countries, it's very similar. So there were difficulties, for example, in getting an e-commerce business off the ground, right? Um, we had to go the route of going overseas um, and setting up the infrastructure that we needed in order to be able to accept payments online. And that in and of itself was a very expensive venture for us up front um, for various reasons. No. There are tools that are there that are a little bit easier, um, make it a little bit easier. But getting an e-commerce business off the ground in the Caribbean with the present infrastructure can be a difficult and time-consuming thing. Um, another thing I, I, I think was particularly challenging was learning how to manage a diverse team. So as the business started to grow, um, what I found was that the, so the skills that I had around managing a junior staff member, for example, and the approach used would be different from what's required to manage people at a mid-level, people who are at a more senior level, um, and getting the most out of those people and managing the diverse personalities within the company. I think, I think that's a very difficult thing. That's where you start to transition from being manager into leader, um, starting to understand how do I take these two different people who have very different personalities and still get maximum effort and input out of both people. And it's, Learning how to manage people is also a, a very difficult part of it as well. Um, and definitely financing, you know, I'd, I'd definitely be lying if I didn't say that access to capital has, hasn't been extremely difficult. And I find that it's, 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 it's a tough situation, accessing capital as a young business in the Caribbean, in Jamaica. Um, and I think there are so many young businesses with bright founders that just need the capital injection to build out on what they've already started with. Right, right. So as you're transitioning your roles in your business, you're now forced to pivot, right? And that's a word that we've heard a lot in the pandemic. So you pivoted from quick plate to quick cart, where you moved from servicing restaurants and, and deliveries of food to now grocery items and other items. So talk to me a little bit about that shift and how, how did you handle that? Right, so I would, I would less call it a pivot and more an extension of services because it was basically wow. us leveraging the same technology that we had and the same expertise that we had developed and moving from just food delivery to be able, being able to deliver just about anything else. And the thing about food delivery is that it's, it's, it's pretty difficult in terms of just having more or less an hour to get everything done um, before a customer starts to you know, get a little bit antsy. And once you've more or less mastered 
food delivery. You can pretty much deliver anything else, you know. Um, but COVID actually accelerated the plans that we had in place. For sure. So it was always something that we planned to do eventually to expand into delivering more than just food. But definitely the COVID-19 crisis showed us that there were people who didn't want to leave home and wanted a way to get whatever they needed still brought to them. And so what would be some of the takeaway lessons? What are some of the, what would be your top three lessons I'd say that you've learned as an entrepreneur in this time and space? Uh, so top three lessons. So I'll, I'll just go back to, I'll go back to the things that I mentioned. So one, it's going to get harder before it gets easier. Especially again, if you're running a business with employees, with lots of processes, with lots of moving parts. So just prepare yourself for that, prepare yourself mentally for that, get the support you need and make sure that you take yourself, like I said, very important, so I'm saying it again. Mm -hmm. um, another important thing I want people to bear in mind is that as they scale, one of the things that will be very important is paying attention to processes and documenting processes within the business. Mm. So, once you have, once you've developed a set of guidelines around how to handle situations as they arise, you document those. And uh, what you'll find is that you deliver a consistent, it helps you to deliver a consistent customer experience if you're a customer facing business, regardless of who is in front of the customer because you have clear guidelines and processes. And it also helps you to onboard new people, which also helps with the scaling process and the speed at which you can start scaling when you do need to scale. Um, so that that's two. Yeah. Um, and also, also one once again, um, just making sure that you put the right people in place around you. Your team is going to become very very critical as you start to grow. Um, the superwoman or superman thing only lasts for so long, only works for so long. And beyond the initial stages of the business, a lot of what you're able to accomplish will depend on the, the, the quality of talent that you bring on board and whether those people are compatible with the vision that you have for the business and with, and, and, and with how you um, would like to execute your vision. And one of the things I learned from Kiran just now, the digipreneur, was that digital support is super important for your business. So how has your business been impacted by digital support? Uh, so we, are, we aren't a business that, Quick Heart isn't a business that adopted digital. We were digital, digitally led and digitally driven from birth. We were born a digital business. Um, but what, what we find is that that permeates itself throughout the entire business. So it goes beyond just the technology that allows people to order food and groceries and so forth online, but it seeps into how we do things inside the business as well. So for example, we run a paperless office because everything is in the cloud. Um, we use Slack and all those kinds of collaboration tools, um, Monday.com, all those tools that help us to work the way we need to without being in the same room all the time. Uh, you find that everything that, every problem that we encounter within the business, especially on the operations side, we think, how can we use technology to solve this in a way that is scalable? So we're, we're very technology first and very digital first in our approach, and we've always been that way. Awesome, so take care of yourself manage your teams and know that every level comes a new devil. Those are my three takeaways from you today, Monique. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been a pleasure chatting with you. And whenever I come to Jamaica, I will definitely use Quick Cart for my food delivery services. Thank you so much, Monique. Awesome, thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Anthea. Let me tell you something. One thing I would take away is that you can't be a superhero. You can't be a superman. You can't be a superwoman. Nope. And I think the, the whole idea 
is that at the end of the day, team dynamics is so essential, so important. You know, sometimes we manage a product mm -hmm. and we get it out there. But some of the most difficult things, and I'm saying that as a director of people, the right? The human. <laughs> some of the most difficult things to do in business is to manage staff. Yeah. And to bring them in. And, and you know, Mark said it well, Anthea, you know, you got to have people who are willing to tell your story a million times over. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I love that she also took the idea of the pivot that we've been talking so much in the pandemic and she used it as leverage. She yeah. doesn't see her company pivoted. She saw that she leveraged what she already had to scale her business. And so I just love the idea of taking what you have or using what you already have and just taking it to the next level as opposed to making a complete change. Exactly. And, you know, I want to congratulate you because you're a digipreneur in so many ways, <laughs> an entrepreneur, a creative yeah. Uh, the work that you've done in country has been exceedingly, Thank you. exceedingly, exceedingly, you've done exceedingly well. But, you know, I can't ever walk away from the wedding of the century. <laughs> It Darren, we need to do a forever. redo, a redo, another one, just a party. <laughs> <laughs> Great. I love Monique's outlook on business. Um, you know, and I want to thank Anthea Ferguson for expertly guiding us through the fireside chat. I've watched her for years in her journalism journey, and I've taken some nuggets away. And so I dabble every now and then using some of my hard best practices <laughs> and some others. Now we're taking things a little closer to home. For us here in the Bahamas, I'm delighted to welcome not only one, but two of our BTC customers here in studio today. Let's give it up for our very own, very own, Moni Kana from Ocean View Pets and Nathaniel Adams from Wicked Wings. I happen to know both of these individuals personally. And so I wanna just give us an opportunity to just get some insights via our video presentation to tell us a bit more about them. Today, we're shining the customer spotlight on Nathaniel Adams, owner of Wicked Wings Mobile Food Truck, and Monique Hanna, owner of Ocean View Pet Boutique. Nathaniel launched his business during the pandemic, and now they're known for offering 10 flavors of wings with Bahamian flair. Meanwhile, Monique's Ocean View Pet is your new favorite pet boutique located in the capital of the Bahamas, New Providence. The pet boutique provides a memorable escape into a world for pets and pet lovers filled with gifts, treats, supplies, toys, and so much more. Nathaniel and Monique are here to tell you how they pivoted to success and how they took their business online with the help of our fiber-fast internet and our new smart solutions. So I want to drive right in with Nathaniel, who I happen to call Nat, you know, <laughs> Nat, you're a proprietor of Wicked Wings, uh, a mobile food truck base here in the Bahamas. Tell us about your business and, and how did you get started? Because let me tell you, those Go Pepper Wings just give me life. <laughs> well, if someone had told me in 2019 that I would have a wings business in 2020, I would never believe them. Um, as you know, you know, everybody, you know, during the pandemic, we were all at home. Everyone was, you know, making their different, uh, wings and banana breads. And, you know, we were all posting on Facebook, you know, and so we were all just having fun. And then I started to do these wings. And then I had friends on Facebook who were like, man, listen, when this lockdown is done, um, I won't taste them. So of course the marketing uh, 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 manager and me said, boy, this is, uh, there's a market for this, you know? And so I sat my family down and I was like, look, we locked down. We don't have anything to do anyway. Let's just try something, you know? So, um, I came up with, um, four flavors originally, um, came up with the process. I was like a, like a, a madman, like a, like a scientist in a laboratory at 3 a.m. in the morning, just frying one wing at a time, trying to get the flavor right, trying to get the sauce right. And, um, and, and then we, we launched it and we had hundreds of orders. And so I realized that it was greater than, than anything that I'd ever thought about. And it took right off. Um, like everyone else uh, has said for the, for the, for the day that it, it, it's business. So it has its challenges, but it was, a, it's a fantastic journey to be on. You know, you know, Nat, I, I, I'm sitting on this stage and I recognize, you know, I have two of uh, two friends of mine, you know, close friends of mine. You started off as a, you know, in music, mm -hmm. uh, music teacher, doing some amazing music camps and, and really successful in one of the top schools. Right. And then I have with me Monique. Mm -hmm. And if anybody knows Monique in this country, they would know that Monique 
uh, you know, had been the queen of hospitality and, and the queen of events. And, and I, I did a lot of events with you. You know, yes. how did you make that pivot? Like, how did you get started, you know, making that pivot from hospitality operations and now this is where you're at? I was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> it was crazy. Um, it was an amazing thought. Um, I sat down one evening and I, I loved animals. And I said to my family, that's what I came home to do every day. Play with my animals after a hard day of work. <laughs> and um, we talked about it and they say, go for it. And it was a major support from my family that has brought us to where we are today. And then the customers, they grew and they grew and they became like family. So great support and um, the experience being in the hospitality industry, it really brought home what customer service was all about mm -hmm. and putting it into my business and making it Indeed. successful. Indeed. Wow, wow. So, you know, we know the pandemic put a huge strain on small business owners, but it also provided the opportunity for new businesses to emerge from the ashes. How did you navigate the COVID era? You know, looking back, is there anything you, you wish you'd done differently or any lessons learned that you, you know, you can share with us today? I'm going to start with you, Nat, because you talked about the pandemic. You talked about that experience. And I don't know if you remembered, I ordered a pan of wings yeah, from you yeah. in the midst of the pandemic. <laughs> so tell me about that. Um, sometimes, like you said, you said something about uh, coming from the ashes. Mm. Um, it, it, it was, I mean, although we're still kind of in it, but at Glory. that time, Glory. It, was, it was a <laughs> dismal time, you know, it was tough. Um, and I personally believe that it was that time that really brought out the best in many people. I, I can definitely say for myself. Um, and so it was that very moment of the crushing, the, the, pressure, the pressure that created the diamond, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and I, I'm, I'm happy to be able to say that, yes, lockdowns happened. Yes, COVID happened. And, it, I, I, and I know it was dismal for a lot of people, but I came out definitely, my family and I, with, with something that I know that we can pass on for generations to come. And the beauty about your business is as I watch you and I, I watch your movements and I follow the truck, Indeed. you know, <laughs> um, you know, the family is so close by you. And, you know, that goes, you know, Monique, I know your family and, and yes, I know I know what you're yeah. what you're doing. And, yeah. you know, I, I asked you the same question, you know, when you think about your type of work now in the pandemic, you know, working with pets and, you know, people in the lockdown, how did you make that that pivot? Pivot is the key word. Uh, you now realize that the pets are not only pets, they've, they've become emotional yeah. support. Mm -hmm. They've become family members. They support you. They give you love. I mean, just for nothing, just for being there. Mm -hmm. And so it helps you to realize that these are things that you need. They don't need anything from you, but the same thing that you give them. Wow. Love and caring sharing mm. and they give you loyalty for life oh and so this is important whether it's a bird a cat a dog a, a fish it's there mm -hmm. it's there and that is what my family and i uh we dreamt of giving back and that's our way of giving back and it's really a family business from my children being involved from every aspect mm -hmm. to my youngest even studying to be a veterinarian to wow. also join into the business. Generation. You know, Generation. Uh, Seeing that invest from one level to the next. Wow. But you know, Monica, I want to talk to you about something really seriously. You know, serious. I have a husky and I, I, I'm questioning his loyalty. Um, and I'm also questioning his respect. You know, <laughs> the only thing I get from him right now is just hair, hair <laughs> everywhere. So I'm going to be sending him to you very soon. You know, yes. We know having a strong connection is essential for any small business to succeed. And you are customers with BTC. And, you know, I, I thank you for choosing BTC Business as your connectivity provider. Nathaniel, as the owner of a food truck, I'm, and I'm smiling at this, I imagine the reliable connectivity for on the go is important for your business specifically. Is that the case? And, you know, what do you do to enable this? Connection is very, very important. Just like you said, um, if we didn't connect with people, we would have no business. 
we only have business because we are able to connect with people. And so um, that's a physical connection. Mm -hmm. And then also there is being able to connect because on an internet level and a phone level and a BTC level, because I literally run my business from my cell phone platform. Right. People call in orders, so that's so they're they're calling. People like me. People right. Like people me. like you. You know. Uh, people are putting orders through WhatsApp, um, and so all of these different things require connection, and then that enables us to connect with them on a different level. Like the guy said earlier, we're here to solve problems. Exactly. People are hungry. Because when I need that <laughs> so chicken, so we must feed them. That's when I need that chicken. You know, I remember coming to one of your um, follow the truck moments. Indeed. And I only had twenty dollars. Right. But I really knew I needed to eat more than twenty dollars, right? Because I had to match the food with the spirit, indeed, right? Indeed. But when you told me that you had a working card machine and connectivity, <laughs> it was fire, indeed, <laughs> in indeed. my spirit, indeed. So you know, more and more, we you know, we see from the small business community that in today's digital age, getting your business out there and online is the secret sauce to success yeah. and you know nathaniel i know you've done this with wicked wings but can you tell me money you know the pet is essential the pet is important there's information you need about your pet how have you used this in your business we have used it in every aspect with online with wi-fi with telephone with whatsapp with facebook everything social media and we are able to not only advertise a product, but to also give you knowledge of the product, to answer your questions that you may have. If we do not have the, the answers to your questions, we speak with several uh, professionals in the industry that we ask them questions and they answer and we are able to relate to you. Um, it's important and I really value BTC for it, for keeping us connected, keeping us on top. I mean, they took us to another level within this business at Ocean View Pet Boutique. You know what, I, you just, you know, if they did not give me the instructions that I had to sit in my seat, I would be running around this studio right now. So you are telling me, let me just restate this for our studio audience and those joining virtually, that it is because of our flow business, Indeed. because of BTC, Indeed. that your businesses are powered yeah. by, oh, come on now. Indeed. Come on, studio <laughs> audience, give them a round of applause. <laughs> Indeed, indeed. <laughs> oh, I think we're having too much fun. Yeah, yeah. I love it though. <laughs> Monique, what would you say to a small business owner looking to take their first steps into showcasing their business online, but they don't know where to start? Maybe they don't have the skills to do it themselves or the finances to hire someone or they really the time to even think about it. What helped you make this leap? Dr. Google. Google. Dr. Google. And the last speaker. Was Remind me of his name. Kiran. Mm -hmm. He was absolutely spot on. He was fantastic with it. And Dr. Google is my answer for everything. Google powered by BTC. By BTC. Yes, yes. 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 Because it's because of that reliable <laughs> connection. Right? And so, yes. so, so now I want to bring this question. You know, we're proud to have a huge community of small business owners, you know, watching from across the Caribbean. Love our Caribbean people. Please put your yeah. island in the chat. Put it in the chat right now. Yeah. You know, what's the one piece of, of advice that you would give a budding entrepreneur or a small business owner who's just starting out? All right. So this is what I would say to you. Come on now. The three us. S's now. Hey. Start small. Start scrappy start where you are start small as in you're not gonna you, you're not gonna be the big the big boys you're gonna have maybe one customer you serve that one customer with excellence as best you yes. can yes yes then you get two more you serve them as best you can yes. i said start scrappy that may have a negative connotation but guess what we have these things in our mind we want it to look a certain way and never start and then we never start no start like in the bahamas start right where you is hey and yes. then when you do that Yes. You can always improve, improve. and then yes. get better and then improve your product. You, you know, Mark said that, right? Yeah. Mark said, you know, sometimes we're so busy looking for the end success. Yeah. The four quartiles and every quartile matter. Mm -hmm. You know, the first and the fourth yeah. is important. How you start, 
right. and how you progress to the, mm -hmm. not the mm -hmm. end, but to the mm -hmm. continuum or to right. the iteration. Yes. And so, you know, Monique, I know, you know, you, many days you sat me down in your, in your old office at the Hilton and, <laughs> you know, given me some advice as a, as a young professional. Yeah. What advice do you give some of the, our, 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 our individuals who are watching, our, our entrepreneurs who are watching, that you are, you know, it's real talk, no chaser. Some advice that you give them as an entrepreneur. If you have a dream, no one can fulfill your dream you. like you can. Indeed. And you have to stay focused and stay the course and have faith mm -hmm. and know what you are providing, the service that you are providing and provide it to the best of your ability. You know, this hits both what Karan was saying and what Mark was saying. Mark says you have to be your authentic self. Indeed. You have to show up as who you are. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can't be, you, you, not that you can't, but you shouldn't try to be what they're doing in the north or what they're doing in the south. You know, I, I use this word and, you know, this is the Bahamas, so I could use it. The junglers say it best. Yeah. <laughs> Do you, boo-boo? Do you? Do you? Do you? <laughs> because if, if, if you are so busy doing everybody else, <laughs> yes. there's nobody who can do the idea that you have yeah. as yeah. great as you can. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody can be as best of a Monique as Monique can be a best of yeah. Monique. Mm -hmm. Nobody could be as best of a Nat. I mean, I've tried the gold pepper. I took the gold <laughs> pepper, I cut it up, and I put the wings in there. I didn't do the laboratory, but right, was right. trying to get that feeling and flavor. It didn't hit, so I no. give up. <laughs> and nobody could be the best version of Darren as Darren can be Darren. Yeah. And so it resonates with me. What, what both of you are saying is that at the end of the day, I love it. Start small. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Start scrappy. Mm -hmm. What that next one is? Start where you is. And start where you is. <laughs> <laughs> and start where you is. <laughs> you know, I, I. Oh my goodness, are you are you having a good time in the studio audience? If 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 you. If you are having a good time and you're joining us virtual from anywhere around the world, just put it in the chat. Put it where you're, where you're from. You know, I also want people in the chat to exchange ideas mm -hmm. and, to, and to get to know each other from different parts of the world. Because at the end of the day, Wicked Wings could become a franchise. It will be. Yeah. You're, 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 you know, and, and you could have some veterinarians who are on right now who is connecting Indeed. with Monique. Because at, this, at the end of the day, success breeds success. Mm -hmm. And beyond that, as a, as a diaspora, mm -hmm. we must mm -hmm. come together and work together to take over the world. Yes. I mean, look at innovation. Innovation started off right here in the Bahamas in a ballroom. Mm -hmm. We now worldwide. Worldwide. Big things are gone. Big things. Big things. Big things. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Nathaniel and Monique, for joining us here today. I know your story will inspire many small business owners who are watching today. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in sharing a huge congratulations to our final six. And make sure you join us next week, Friday, for our final event to see who wins first second and third. I'm not going to be the one, so I won't make the mistake as, of Steve Harvey, but I will tell you, <laughs> it is going to be amazing. Today, I am joined with our CEO here in BTC, who is definitely making certain that we make waves, that we keep connectivity, that we continue to push and press and get bigger and even bolder. And I'd like to say that a part of our success and what we're doing is because he keeps us on our toes. Help me welcome the one and only Mr. Andre Foster. Well, look, Darren, thank you. And look, I am so impressed with what I have seen this morning. It has been an impressive day. And I got to give a big shout out to all the speakers and of course to all those watching across the Caribbean, but especially those here in our studio. You guys, a round of applause for yourselves because it's been so amazing yeah. to feel the energy in this room. So, you know, look, you know, uh, you know, Tanil said it best, we are so proud of the Innovation Conference because this really started from something very small here in the Bahamas and it's evolved and so proud to see how much it's grown. And as you said, Darren, now across the Caribbean. So look, these are excellent empowerment sessions for small and medium businesses. It gives us an opportunity to see what others are doing. And I'm impressed with the, like the caliber of folks that are actually speaking to us. So Mark Farrell, what an incredible story. I mean, an impressive journey and just doing great things. You know, I listened to Quran on what we can do around social media and that space about promoting our businesses and learning more about what's out there. 
incredible the strength that you get just by going to the internet. Uh, and of course, Monique, you know, that story is an amazing story of, you know, the innovation she's taken her business, and again, the expansion of her business to do other things. I mean, impressive stories. And again, we're so pleased that BTC Business and our customers that are here featured today could not be more proud of, you know, Wicked Wings. And certainly, uh, I have a dog too who, who uh, contributes a lot of hair to my house too, uh, Darren. So, so I'm definitely going to be checking out uh, the things that we can do with our local veterinarian. Uh, and look, I'm just proud to be a part of this. You know, I want to make sure that everybody knows that we are taking businesses to higher heights through the Flow Business Series and through innovation. And remember to tune in next week because we are in the middle of, again, a series. Next week, they'll have the closing of this great event, and I can't wait to see what's going to be there. It's going to be amazing. It may not have Darren there to make it even as amazing as it was today, but I'm sure it's going to be great. And most important, I want to thank you, Darren, and Ianthea for her great, great job today. So thank you to everyone. Have a great day. And remember, flow business is the way to go. Of course, when we think about all that's happened today, we really, really, really recognize that it could not be done with the people who are sitting on the stage, the people who are sitting behind the stage, the people who are in Miami, everywhere. So ladies and gentlemen, I'll say that brings our event to a close. And what a show. Be sure to join us at the same time next week, 9 a.m. Jamaica time, 10 a.m. Miami time. We'll be hearing from Kadeen Mayers, founder of Dollar Financial, a micro lending business, which this month listed on the Jamaica Stock Exchange. Wow, fantastic. We're also joined by artist manager, Romik Major, and TV host and content creator, Yendi Phillips. So plus our six finalists will pitch live to win first, second, and third place prizes and walk away with their share of 15,000 US dollars in cash and services. I wanna say thank you to the entire Flow business and BTC business, to our CEO, thank you as well, Andre Foster. I wanna end with these words. I live my life by the saying, it says, measure not life by the hopes and enjoyments of this world, but rather by the preparation it makes for each and every one of us, looking forward to what you shall be, rather than backward to what you have been. In the words of Mark, make certain that you are your authentic self every day. Secure your brand. Make certain also, in the words of Moni, that you don't try to be the superhero, but you see the importance of team and the value. You know, I thought what Nat said was so important. Start small, start scrappy, and be who you is. You know, and at the end of the day, I leave you with these final words. Be like Nike and just do it. I'm Kate Aaron Turnquest signing off. Hopefully, I'll see you next year.